the Village School District Board of Education meeting. It's actually June 20th, not June 15th. Um, please join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. The Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Dr. Corman? Here. Ms. D. Here. Mr. Janice? Here. Mr. Miller? Here. Mr. Kahn? Here. Okay. All right, so good evening, everyone. Uh, before I get into the commendations, um, we kind of have an ad hoc throw in here. Um, I don't know if any of you are aware, but uh, Michaela De Janeiro. Um, actually took first place in the national competition uh, that New Balance put together, correct? Is it the New Balance Nationals? Um, she ran a time of 4.42. She won state in Ohio running a 4.53 or 4.52. So shaved almost 10 seconds off of her, uh, her time to win a national title. So in that race, there were about seven other state champions that were competing with her. And if you haven't looked at the advocate. Or the Sentinel. Or the Sentinel. <laughs> either one. You, you, can, uh, you can see the link to the race. And, and uh, it is absolutely fantastic. And we welcomed uh, Michaela back this afternoon in kind of an ad hoc fashion, but it was kind of nice to see. So um, it's great to recognize our talented students. And I, tonight, I get to recognize several others. Uh, first, we have the FCCLA members from uh, the Granville High School and Middle School who earned top honors this spring at the Ohio Family, Career, and Community Leaders of America competition in Columbus. The team uh, from GMS, FCCLA members, Alexandra and Sydney Mazik, won first place in the junior division for their Focus on Children project. Their gold medal project now moves them on to the national FCCLA Leadership Conference in July in San Diego, which is a very nice location. Uh, we'd like to wish them good luck. And uh, when Sydney comes up, uh, she says she can tell us about their winning project. So looking forward to that. From the high school, we had Penny Fisher, who won a gold medal and was third in the state with his Teach and Train project on the teaching of Korean. Debbie Bigley and Alex Van Winkle uh, competed in the category of advocacy and won a gold medal, taking fourth in the state for their project on human trafficking. Congratulations to all these gold medal earners. So I'd like you to come on up at this time. everybody about your project. Okay. Um, we put so much into this project that uh, there's just so many things that um, I could talk about. Um, so we started just some of the um, major details of the project. We started a school garden at the elementary school for second graders and third graders and started a garden club for them. We taught gardening and gardening and cooking lessons for the second and third graders, as well as cooking lessons for the middle schoolers. And we also had a farm to school project for the middle schoolers and high schoolers, uh, teaching them about where the food for their breakfast and lunches came from. And hmm, I'm trying to think of any other things. Um, I don't know. I think, I that's, think that's great. I think that's, I think that's a great summary. And I have to say, I think you're probably the only uh, Granville student that has had lunch with the president. So, um, <laughs> you know, that's a pretty high honor as well. So, congratulations, congratulations to all of you. Okay, Thank you. Thank you. 
Next, we are going to commend Granville students who earned top prizes in the Fairfield Ch Challenge, sponsored by Fairchild Challenge, sponsored by Dawes Arboretum. Fairchild Challenge is an interdisciplinary environmental science competition designed to engage students of diverse interests, abilities, and backgrounds to explore the natural world. In the first Fairchild Challenge, People and Edible Plants, two students in GHS Environmental Science and Visual Communication class earn top prizes. They are Fiona Carr from Licking Valley and Daniel Maurer from Granville. They took third place in the high school division with their entry T. I don't think they were able to make it tonight. So um, we'll go on to the middle school division. Um, GMS students were consistently at the top. Sarah Wallenfels entered her school garden planning and design in the second Fair, Fair Child Challenge and won first place for the GES Get Up and Grow Garden with uh, her friends, the Mazics, um, who won second place for, and third in, for the third Fairchild Challenge at Dawes Arboretum. She actually tied for first place. Um, in a global challenge about the environmental change with a 300 word essay plus an eight panel comic strip pertaining to invasive plants. Her entry was also one of 10 considered in the International Global Challenge. And Sydney Mazik won first place in the fourth Fairchild Challenge, Recycling Upcycling, with a purse made from men's neckties. I have a bunch of really old ones if you need them. Um, and I, I think Mitch Lerner does too. Um, <laughs> just saying, I've seen his wardrobe. Um, Granville Middle School won second place overall and a check for $300 in uh, the middle school division for the Fairchild Challenge. Congratulations to those students. If you're here, come on. well-rounded children. Um, once again this year we had a GHS art student that was selected for the Ohio Governor's Youth Art Award. GHS senior and now graduate Anna Moorhead uh, saw her graphic dra graphite drawing entitled Times New Roman on display at the Rhodes Tower as part of the Ohio Governor's Youth Art Exhibit. Uh, someone expressed interest in buying her artwork so I believe she is in contract negotiations. <laughs> um, so congratulations to Anna. And we'd like to um, commend, obviously, our students, but also our staff. So uh, finally tonight is the annual Leaders for Learning recognition. Uh, GHS math teacher Renee Runyon is among the area's best educators recognized with the Licking County Foundation Leaders Learn, Leaders for Learning Award. She was surprised in her classroom by a representative of the foundation who presented Renee with an uh, art glass apple symbolizing the knowledge and inspiration she imparts to students and the community uh, and the community's appreciation for her efforts. Renee teaches advanced algebra two and geometry and has been a teacher for 23 years. In nominating her, Principal Matter said, Renee Runyon embodies the role of a professional educator. As a mathematics teacher at Granville High School for more than a decade, she has established herself as a nurturing person who cares deeply for her students. At the same time, she has, a clear, has clear curricular goals that she challenges her students to achieve. Renee could not be here tonight, but asked me to say these words. I am truly honored to have been recognized, and Granville is a special place to teach. So I'd like to congratulate Renee Renner. So now, this is the time where if you want to leave, this is the window of opportunity you have. So it's purely up to you, but we always like to give that window. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Walk slowly. Thank you. And I would love
like to invite Chef John up to present to you our AVI um, annual update. <coughs> Chef John is at the end of his first year, correct? <coughs> or second year? Is this your second year? Second year. year of second, wow, time flies. <laughs> So this is a little overview of what I'll be going over real quick. Um, we've got five to ten minutes to go over some information with you. Uh, we have our changes in the program of last year versus this, Brandonville Schools and ABI Partnership, our student engagement and promotions, our financial overview, and goals of what we think is important and what you guys value. Didn't realize it looked so small up there. My apologies. They're close. <laughs> Um, some of the changes we've done from last year to this year, uh, we've introduced Smoothie Day at the Intermediate School um, with the FCCLA uh, smoothie machine that they won. Uh, we've also introduced a new fruit bar at the elementary school, a breakfast cart program at the Intermediate School. This year, Field Day was something new ABI was invited to at the beginning of the school year. It was held at the stadium. And we've also done several Farm to School marketing, marketing and events, including Farm to School Month. Um, some of our challenges uh, towards spring break area, we had some staffing retention problems. Um, we were able to rehire quickly and have a wonderful new staff now. Uh, we switched our POS systems, uh, lunch accounts from QSP3 to 4, and we've now upgraded again to Quick Lunch. Um, We've also implemented charging at the high school and intermediate to be shown on to lunch accounts so parents can see them at home or online. And we've also increased our lunch at the elementary school, mainly due to fruit bars and pudding days. <laughs> <laughs> um, as, a, as an ABI partnership with Grandma Schools, together we've trained and developed new, full, uh, new food service members we started a breakfast program at the Intermediate. Together we've added variety to menus focusing on local and fresh. Uh, we've worked on hourly budgets. We've changed the menu to accommodate the needs of students through surveys twice a year. Uh, we've cr I've mentioned Smoothie Day. Um, each time we've done Smoothie Day, I have almost sold out and each student comes up to me asking when's the next day and what's the next flavor. It's a huge hit down there. Um, I've gotten all kinds of flavor suggestions from chocolate chip and gummy worm to orange <laughs> pineapple. So it's very interesting. <laughs> um, of course, we've done the fruit bar, and the elementaries now have a, a choice to choose a variety of fruit instead of just one given, which was last year's. And of course, we've all uh, together we've met weekly to ensure clear communication. Uh, we've also recently <coughs> added a district office ordering guide for the uh, administrators up here to order lunches. That was something that we implemented. One of our, or throughout the year, we've done marketing promotions. Uh, this year's promotion was from Farm School, fits perfectly in for Granville. Uh, the goal of these marketing promotions is to maximize participation. Uh, we take uh, give take-home recipes to the elementary students. There's a few samples over there on the table if you want to take some. Um, they're focused on growing sales and, of course, focusing on uh, fresh culinary events. Um, these, these recipe cards and poster boards we've done, we've had a wide range from broccoli, carrots, cranberries, potatoes, and winter squashes. Uh, whenever available, we've tried to source those locally as well. Um, we've had the ABI quarterly newsletter. It's been posted on the website for all to see. Um, and of course, on the website, we've also have our menus and ways of contacting any of the food service. Um, and surveys we've done twice a year. Our financial overview. Um, we are adding production and equipment process to uh, to process more fresh produce, um, which is our SAMIC 
uh, food processor is coming in. As of right now, at the high school, we don't do french fries. Uh, we've always done roasted diced potatoes, which the ladies cut by hand. Having this food processor will take an hour's chunk of labor for them and cut it down to 10 minutes. Um, of course, we'll, we'll be adding a flat screen TV to the Nutribar area, which will display educational, seasonal, and promotional information, as well as telling the kids where their local food is coming from. Uh, some of these numbers were pulled from our May P&Ls at those years, except for the last one, which accidentally says 2014 through 16. <laughs> it should be 15 through 16, and that was an April number. As of May, we did 16,450. And then I have a little section for goals. Uh, notes I took with our subcommittee that we did earlier. Um, goals of Granville and ABI is, of course, understanding food distribu distribution and sustainability. Um, and our goal is, as ABI is to meet these federal guidelines and state guidelines while providing a fresh and local product for you. Uh, any questions? Well, I'd just like to... Yeah, the numbers in the past page, are those your revenue that were changing? Are those expenses or those income? Those were or? above the line uh, profits. Oh, fantastic. Great. So, and what I was going to say is uh, the Board of Education has taken the approach that um, we want to r operate right at that line of um, profit and loss. So, you know, we don't want to make money, but we also don't want to have to subsidize from the operating budget um, the program. So we walk that delicate line and what we've we've taken the approach of doing is really trying to um, use that excess revenue to get you additional equipment to, to, better, know, the program to the better the program for everybody. So that money will be kind of rolled back into the program as well as what Mr. Sobel will have an action item. Because um, there are costs outside of what you do that we incur and so we have a couple of action items related to that or at least one yeah and then I'll, I'll also have a recap in my monthly report yeah later on in the and end. i believe yours shows a proje projection of twelve thousand. yeah about at the 12, end of june correct twelve thousand at the end of june and i i think it's a fantastic <laughs> opportunity for you to highlight the fact that we we do source a lot of local um, what's the per current percentage? In um, it's actually dipped from last year's. We're down to a 28%, which was 33 yes, last year. Um, several things have contributed to that. Uh, we had a staffing issue, um, and one of the things that also contributed is we lost Falrick, a local provider this year, okay. who used to do our baked chips. That was a large contribution to our local purchases. But you're always looking for absolutely. Okay. In fact, I just learned uh, the school does not have to purchase uh, pasteurized eggs. So I'm in contact with Happy Chicken Farms about local eggs. Excellent, fantastic. Can I ask a question? Just being new to the sure. board here, and I see that there's two things that they want cheaper lunches. Just what does our lunches cost for each place? Two seventy at the intermediate and elementary. Two ninety five at the middle school and high school, or a three twenty option, depending on where they eat. Okay. And we have kept those prices consistent for two this years. Is the second year that they have second, not changed. Correct. So presumably, the increased revenue is because more kids are using the service, right? Correct. Which is fantastic. It's really great quality product. John, what's the takeaway from the student surveys that you do twice a year? You said. You eliminate some items that aren't popular and add others. What do you right. generally? Um, what do you what do you hear from students? Generally, things I don't want to hear. They want soda, candy, and <laughs> all those. Um, but most of the time, I get some very valuable feedback, um, either through suggesting different Asian dishes because we've had so many for so long, um, and just changing those up. Uh, some of the other things that we mentioned. There's uh, actually some results in the back of your folders. Um, but some of the things that we ask it is, uh, do you feel like we offer enough healthy options? Do you appreciate, are you satisfied with the friendliness of our staff? Um, of course, there are suggestions for uh, what would you like to see us serve? What is your favorite thing that we serve? So it's a broad question piece. I think it's always interesting to 
under to understand and comprehend what you have to do from a, a food service providing uh, regulation <coughs> perspective because a lot of kids are used to a lot of food on their plate um, when they go to a restaurant but right. um, you're not allowed to serve in that capacity right. in that volume any other questions Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, John. Mm -hmm. Mike, you can make that off. I'm just hoping. Oh, that's okay. That's okay. This was going to be a very brief um, <laughs> conversation about updated board policies. Um, usually, OSBA puts out policies in the fall and uh, usually by November and then again in February based on the recent activity of the General Assembly. Uh, this year, because of their activity, they also put out a May edition. So um, we've been reviewing those policy updates. M most of the policy updates are required changes based on legislation. So it's really not something that is uh, really a drastic change based on our current policy, uh, but more of a, a language change or, or a date change. So um, what I'd like to do is just share with you the laundry list. Um, and I do say laundry list of um, items. Okay. So the first list uh, includes something new from a teacher evaluation perspective, but it's actually school counselors. Mm -hmm. um, these two board policies, uh, we are recommending that they change. There was some permissive language on the evaluation cycle uh, because if you scored in the accomplished rank, uh, you could also have a two or three year cycle depending, depending on that permissive language. So we did accept that permissive language in our policy. But this evaluation uh, document is very similar to OTES. It's just the school counselor version of that policy. Uh, it, I sit on the state standards board. We were the ones that recommended this, this change. And uh, then a subcommittee of the state board worked on revising it according to state and local or national uh, standards for guidance counselors or school counselors. So uh, we have those. Um, all of the student transportation um, and bus safety and district managed transportation really are just mostly um, uh, title changes uh, instead of transportation departments now it's district managed transportation so simple changes like that in in the um, in the language for uh, our transportation department nothing really changed except for a date change on the drug testing for district personnel required to hold a commercial driver's license we do do that we require anybody that is driving a child um, to be entered into a randomized pool for drug testing. Um, and then non-routine uses of buses, previously special use of school buses. So really just language changes. Um, there were some uh, slight tweaks to programs for students with disabilities um, and remedial instruction, mostly date changes um, from when we have to collect assessment data. Um, there were some additional requirements that were part of College Credit Plus, um, most of which are a byproduct of the fact that the General Assembly and the uh, Institute of Higher Education worked relatively quickly to create College Credit Plus, and they are now realizing the ramifications of what that does in a K-12 setting. So we're getting annual updates related to that program. Um, I did talk with uh, Re Rebecca Watts from the uh, Department of Higher Education 
and they are doing a summary analysis of the first year of College Credit Plus. They're looking at it from a course selection perspective, um, a success rate, um, and a financial piece to see how much money from K-12 actually uh, went to the uh, public colleges. Um, admissions of homeless students, it really is an expansion of their definition of homeless and some tweaks in the language. And then again, you see some additional uh, district managed transportation, immunization, and then some additional uh, college credit plus. So that's really a summary of it. If there was anything substantial or material in those changes, I would have highlighted it for you. But for the most part, it's just benign changes to our existing policies. Any questions on that? Nope. Pretty quick. This is just a first read, right? So it we'll is. Next. Yes. yes. <clears throat> Any question? OK, excellent. Moving on. Yes, <laughs> moving on. Mr. Durst. <clears throat> While Mr. Durst is setting up, um, want to remind the board that we had a uh, substance abuse forum last on the 15th actually um, and uh, we had about 50 community members that attended that forum to talk a little bit about uh, what the committee had researched as far as uh, substance substance abuse we've had an open survey related to that question and providing feedback to the Board of Education on a potential policy change and so Mr. Durst is going to um, just give you a quick summary of that data and also uh, talk a little bit about some of the things that we're currently doing I know he touched on that in the first board meeting that he presented but we'll, we'll resurface that conversation and then if you notice in the board agenda we have um, public comment related to specifically related to substance abuse um, prior to the board discussion and then there's an additional public comment afterwards okay so we have two public comment related to um, the board agenda today tonight Mr. Durst. Good evening, guys. Good evening. Uh, like Jeff mentioned, uh, last Wednesday we, we did host the community forum. Um, if we go back in time, I provided you guys a March update and then an April update. At the April update, um, we really made the decision um, that we didn't want to do anything in terms of policy um, until the community had been consulted about this issue. Uh, because as Jeff said, it's a potential to polarize um, different people who have different uh, opinions on the topic. So uh, like you said, about 50 people were in attendance last Wednesday night, representing students, parents, <coughs> staff members, but then also um, community members um, that did not have students in the, in the system currently. Um, and they walked through the process um, and the information that evening and what you see in front of you are the numbers for the exit slip that they produced upon leaving. Um, and we jokingly, jokingly said that they, they were not able to leave without turning in one of those exit slips. Um, so we had a pretty good turnaround in terms of the number of folks um, who submitted these. The first question, um, should mandatory random student drug testing um, be in place at GHS? 72% responded positively to that question. Mandatory random student drug testing should be in place at the middle school, 42% responded positively. We did talk about an optional random drug test um, with the results only to the parents. So again, that would cut the district away from the results piece um, and it would allow parents to opt in so that they could then have the benefit of those results. And you see 12% were in favor there. No testing under any circumstances, again, 12%. Um, it is important to note, and I, I do want to make sure that this is stressed, that many of the respondents chose more than one option. 
So they didn't, it, the survey didn't ask them to just simply circle one or their choice for the evening, but what would they be open to on that list uh, of items? And then the final one asked about their opinion changing after hearing the information at the forum, um, and you can see that 8% responded positively to that question. Uh, Mr. Bernath uh, was nice enough to pull the online survey results uh, right around 3 p.m. today. And you can see how the breakdown works there of the respondents. 264 have completed that survey, um, again, as of 3 p.m. today. 223 are parents, 15 students, non-parent community members, 18, uh, and then 15 staff members as well. So the online survey walks them through some very similar questions to the ones that we saw on the exit slip. Uh, the first question, mandatory random drug and alcohol <laughs> testing should be in place at GHS and strongly agree or disagree um, is hovering right around 75%. Second question, um, same question but dealing with the middle school and strongly agree or agree at 68%. The third, I wanted to make sure that you knew this question was in there, um, but these are all narrative responses. Um, so you can understand why I chose not to list all 264 narrative responses. Um, but when the survey closes, I believe Friday, when the survey closes Friday, that will obviously, obviously be information that would, would be passed along. And the board has seen okay. regular updates to okay. those comments. So they. So you have some familiarity with yeah. that. Uh, the fourth question, one potential alternative to the mandatory random testing would be the opt-in program. Again, this is where parents approve, uh, they opt their student in, uh, the student is tested on a random basis, but then those results only go to the family. Do you believe a voluntary opt-in program would reduce substance abuse? Uh, and you see there, 34% strongly agree or agree. Now, other, I know that we've talked about other districts that have opted this way, have gone this way, and so forth. Is that in addition to or completely instead of? You or? know what? At Pickerington, at one of the high schools, they do both. Okay. But by and large, you see one or the other. Pickerington would be an outlier in, the, in that situation. Okay. The fifth question, um, again, do you believe this program would reduce substance abuse, uh, student substance abuse in the community? This is again another potential program being mandatory random drug and alcohol testing. And 56% there strongly agree or agree. And then the sixth, if any form of mandatory testing is implemented, how should that cost be covered? Um, and you can see 43% indicate the districts should assume the responsibility. The parents would be 6%. A combination of district and parents would be 38%. Um, and then other means, <coughs> right around 12%. And could you quickly remind us of what the cost of an annual program like this would be based on other numbers? You know, it all I know there's lots of choices how, you talked about. Test, yeah, it depends on the frequency and, that we want to use for the testing. Um, you're going to have a ballpark number of 20 to $30 per test. So it really depends on how many times do we want to test and how many students per test we would then um, walk through. Rough estimate, 30,000. Okay. I think that's a pretty safe estimate annually. Um, there were a couple of questions that popped up Wednesday that I wanted to make sure to address uh, because they weren't, they weren't something that we addressed directly at the forum, uh, but I wanted to, to reactively um, communicate that information. The if testing were brought through, and then again, that's the big if, um, it would be one component of a multifaceted approach. Uh, nowhere in research is it indicated that random testing in a mandatory fashion alone has any positive impact. The research is very, very clear that this is a component of a multifaceted program if it were to be successful. The two most common things that they pair it with would be a positive school climate and then education. Um, the exit surveys that we've given uh, through the whole child committee for about the past four or five years have not directly said, do you have a positive school climate when they've asked students questions, but they get at things like emotional safety, physical safety, um, I perceive that my teachers care or, or have concern for me. Those have been positive results, 
Uh, we are far from perfect in terms of, <laughs> of climate. I don't want to mislead, but I would, I would qualify our climates in our building as positive. Uh, the second component there would be education. Um, and again, I think there's, there just needs to be, to be some clarity with this. We, we currently are educating students on substance abuse at each level. Um, now obviously you're gonna be much, much more sophisticated with your language at the 912 level versus the K3 level. Um, but I know that um, education has come up. Um, and again, I wanna make this clear. I don't want to make the statement that what we do educationally is perfect. Um, it is in place at each building. Is there the potential to sit down, review, and enhance? Yes, I think that can always be the statement that we make. Um, but I wanted to make sure that that was clear. Yeah. One of the questions I have about that is, um, do most of our kids now take health outside of the school year? Is it still embedded in the standard schedule? or? I know we offer it during the summer. Yeah, it is a freshman, it's, it has grabbed, it used to be sophomore only. Go back 10 years, it was only sophomores that were taking health. Okay. Um, we've really seen it grow in the freshman class and the sophomore class. Um, we have 30 kids sitting in summer health wellness um, that just, well, just finished last Friday. Um, but we do have a percentage, it's not the majority, okay. but we have a percentage every single year that takes health through an online provider because it frees up space in their schedule for other courses. Okay, thank you. It, it, is most of the curricular content delivered by specialists in the area or nursing staff, or is it done by primary staff or classroom teachers? Like, can you just describe a little bit well, what at those the, occasions are those different levels? At, at the K-6 level, they use the nurses, and they also use outside agencies that come into the classrooms to do the education. 7-12, you're seeing that delivered mostly from our teachers. Um, it really drives, uh, I've looked at some curriculum over the weekend, um, and a lot of the curriculum that is out, well one specifically talks a lot about um, a student's ability, not just to recognize and understand what a drug is and what it does to your body, but to understand how to talk your way out of a situation, um, for example. So you're really dealing with, with content that's outside of just the, the traditional substance abuse education. Um, we're, we're no longer looking at can you identify marijuana and then can you identify the causes and effects of it in hopes that you don't use. Our students know what the cause and effect are. Um, and to be honest with you, they know before they get to the high school level what the cause and effect is. Uh, they have got access to information that we didn't have access to when we were their age. Um, and so they're able to to get that and seek it out, and they know very well what the facts are. Any other questions I can answer? So, any other questions for me? Before we go into board discussion, or public, public comment, comment, and then board discussion. What I would like to <clears throat> make sure that, you know, I, I communicate is, when we had this conversation at the beginning of the school year, we kind of talked about this committee forming and Matt taking charge of this committee. Um, and really the charge was to look at random student drug testing. Mm -hmm. And so I think as a byproduct of this conversation, the conversation has evolved more to a comprehensive approach. Um, but I want to recognize that their original charge was very myopic. Yeah. Um, and so that was their, their task. Um, but I, I think we're all recognizing that it's a little bit more of a broad perspective and comprehensive perspective moving forward. Yeah, I really appreciate all the time that the committee has spent in, again, beyond just a, you know one issue to examine, but really thinking about it holistically. And I think that's the key, right? How do we you know, change the culture? You don't do the ch culture change just with a drug test, right? You really have to think about all the other ways that you can educate and in light of the fact that you know information is available Right, you don't need to teach that. You need to teach culture and decision making to some extent. Right? It's the same kind of things we're doing in our other curriculum. It's not just information; it's really decision making. So I think that's going to be an important piece to any solution that we come up with going forward. And I know that we've had a lot of great work by the committee, and I really appreciate that. Well, I, I also want to just applaud the community that that showed up last Wednesday night to participate because the hope, I think, the mutual hope was um, let's. Let's really solicit feedback in a genuine way, um, because 
this may or may not work, but we certainly aren't um, we aren't the, 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 the only ones who own knowledge and ideas. Um, and I received several very thoughtful emails after the forum um, with very good suggestions, um, and one of which led me to do the research over the weekend on the education piece. Um, so we got what we hoped for um, from Wednesday. We got some really solid feedback. Okay. Thank you, Matt. Thanks. <clears throat> Um, at this time, we'd like to entertain public comment um, for the purpose of um, um, specifically the topic of substance abuse. If you'd like to address the board, please come to the podium, state your name and address, and speak for a brief five minutes. All right, there we go. <laughs> Thanks, everyone, and, and Matt in particular. I know how much time you put into that, and, and so I want to say thank you. I, I am going to speak against the uh, drug testing on any level, uh, but I want to first say that I've got nothing but respect for the people who are arguing on the other side of the aisle here. Um, I think the entire community is united with one goal, which is obviously to keep drugs as far away from the hands of our children as possible. We may have questions about how to best do that, um, but, but I think that there's a general consensus that um, what's in the best interest of the students is what's behind everybody's motivation here. So I have nothing but, but respect and admiration for those who feel differently. Um, I'm just concerned about the specific implementation of this program. I would lump my concerns into maybe three broad categories. Um, first is that, to my read of the evidence, the um, drug testing in general doesn't work, or at least the studies are at least at this point inconclusive. Um, I know that the committee has gone through this in great detail, and you've probably looked at many of the same surveys that I have. There are certainly some particularly smaller focused community studies that demonstrate there has been a positive impact, but there's been, I would argue, a majority that show that they haven't had the positive impact that we would like them to have. Um, the, uh, I've looked at lots of these. The best study that I know is uh, University of Michigan has done a couple of very comprehensive studies, one in, I think, 2013. They looked at more than a decade worth of evaluations. I'm sure you have this in your folder. Most of you have probably seen this. Um, very simply, their conclusion, quote, the results presented here show that there are still no significant differences in marijuana use or the use of other illicit drugs as a function of whether or not the school has drug testing of any kind. Um, and I would argue, actually, that the fact that there is such disparity in the results demonstrates that there are so many other socioeconomic and cultural factors that go into the success of these things that to simply implement a project of drug testing without a much more thorough discussion about the things that we were just talking about with regard to education and environment and cultural aspects is really putting the cart before the horse. Um, I would also say with regard to the efficacy of these programs um, that we have to be aware of the possibility of unintended consequences. And I have two concerns here, both of which have been demonstrated in studies. Uh, my biggest concern, and this was demonstrated in the largest national study that I know of, funded by the NIH, which indicated that um, implementing these programs just drove students to drugs that you're not testing for. It's shocking to me how smart our kids can be when they really want to be, um, and how devious they can be. But it's pretty simple. The reality is, for example, marijuana stays in your system for approximately a month, Heroin, cocaine stays for a couple days. Alcohol for a matter of 24 hours. Um, it, it strikes me as very reasonable that students, once they realize this, if they haven't already, are simply going to abandon marijuana because it stays in your system longer in favor of other more harmful narcotics. So we have to be aware of the possible consequences there. The other thing we have to think about is whether or not this drug testing program drives students out of the very activities that we want them to be in. Every study demonstrates that participation in, in drama and athletics and all of those other things is a deterrent to involvement uh, with students in, in using drugs. And so by threatening students with the implicit idea that you're going to be tested at some point, probably, I know it's all random, but we are going to test at some point, and if you get caught, you're facing serious consequences, you may well have students who decide not to participate in that activity at all. And that's the last thing that I think that we want. Um, I have other concerns about the practical efficacy, but I will simply note that um, it's because of these studies and the negative results that they've had that drug testing, the random drug testing program that you're talking about, 
is opposed by the National Education Association, it's opposed by the National Institute for Drug Abuse, um, and it's opposed by the American Association of Pediatrics. And the American Association of Pediatrics statement, which just came out about a year ago, is quite clear that they question whether or not it really works. And so I'm not sure what we presume that we know that these institutes and bodies who have spent years researching it have concluded. Two other broader concerns. Um, one of the practical consequences, <coughs> and I have lots of them, they range from the cost, I know we said 20 to $30, which is a figure that I see commonly tossed around, but understand that the cost increases with the number of different tests that you order, and as students begin the process of trying to get around your testing, that number is probably going to go up and up. I note as well that it impacts the learning atmosphere in ways that I think are not favorable. I think that we have a, a really, because we have a small community and a close community, and, and frankly an incredible collection of teachers up to the high school, I think the relationship that they have, those close bonds with students, get frayed when they're confined to a restroom listening to the kid urinate in, in a pot. So I think it wrecks the environment. Um, I, I also am concerned about um, keeping it confidential. And while I know that the school will do absolutely everything in its power, the reality is these things have a way of, of spilling out. And maybe not immediately, but maybe it's five, ten years down the road. I, as a parent, have to be aware of the fact that somewhere in a file someplace is my kid's name on a drug test that I wasn't in favor of that could be accessed by some personnel, by someone, somewhere. And while I know that you'll do everything possible to keep it secure, the reality is it doesn't always work that way. I'm also concerned about how the kids feel when they are disciplined. I, again, I know from what little I watched a couple of the videos about the discussions we've had, and we're talking about a first offense probably being a confidential counseling before anything happens. But the reality is if, if a kid fails a couple times and is disciplined, even though you're not going to acknowledge publicly why they're disciplined, these things get out. And that's embarrassing. That drives kids away from the activities we want them to be involved with and has long-term negative consequences that, that I would be concerned about. Last broad concern, um, and I'll be very blunt with you. This isn't your business. The reality is if my child is using drugs, that's a family matter. And if he's using it to an extent that's really troubling, then it's a legal and law enforcement act matter. But you're not trained or qualified to get involved in those issues. The reality is this strikes me as an incredibly slippery slope. You are not the police and you're not the enforcers of community morality. You have every right to search lockers and discipline kids who bring marijuana to a dance. But if my kid sits in the basement of my house on Saturday night with his friends and smokes, pots, smokes pot, that's my problem. We don't um, set up roadblocks testing kids for DWI and punishing them. Um, we don't punish kids. I have, I have no idea what the criminal rate is at, Brand at Grandville. I'm sure it's pretty low. Um, but theoretically, if we have kids arrested for robbery or burglary or anything else, I presume they come back to school. The legal system handles them, and you don't expel them or kick them uh, off of athletic. And maybe I'm wrong, Matt. You can correct me if I'm wrong. But um, you don't discipline them for things that are done outside of school that the community has, has deemed inappropriate. Um, I live right here on, on Pearl Street, so I know I'm supposed to start by saying that, Mitchler, 234 North Pearl Street. Um, I can tell you the kids drive down at the end of school, they drive down the road by my house at speeds that are ungodly. I suspect that, um, I would argue, that those kids are a greater menace to themselves and the community around them than the kid that sits in the basement of his house smoking pot on Saturday night. But I presume you're not going after kids who drive too fast. You're not going after kids for DWI, you're not going after kids for any other behavior. When we consider as well that you can't really test for alcohol, which is equally as illegal and probably more addictive and more harmful, um, I think this just create, puts you in a position of enforcing um, rules and laws that are more complicated than we might think and really not any of your jurisdiction. So um, I probably talked too long. Those are, are my thoughts and thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> <clears throat> Anybody else like to address the board? Hi, my name is Vendra Lele. I live in uh, 113 Chicken Place here in Granville. Uh, my uh, comments are also uh, against uh, the mandatory random student. Uh, testing of uh, drugs. Um, I'm almost, you know, basically in entire agreement with everything that Mitch Lerman just said. Um, and I would argue uh, a couple of other things. Um, if, if one looks at, uh, sort of, if one extends the logic 
of testing certain kinds of kids involved in certain kinds of activities. I understand that the Supreme Court has decided that it is unconstitutional to, have to test all children. So I understand that the Constitution, as interpreted by the Supreme Court, prohibits the testing of all students. They're a captive audience, they're compelled by law to be a student, and there's probably, I haven't actually read the Supreme Court decision, probably should have done that, but, but I didn't. But if one just extends, sort of inferentially, the logic, one could infer, uh, there are probably other inferences, but that one could infer that if it were constitutionally permissible, the school district would test every child, every student within its jurisdiction, not just those involved in these other extracurricular activities, but if it were constitutionally permissible, right, the school would be compelled or have every right, one would, ima one would imagine, to test every student. Right? And that seems to me you know, a piece uh, with what uh, Mitch was arguing against. That is, I don't know that it's the school's responsibility or obligation to do those kinds of things. I also think uh, there is research uh, that, again, the committee and I also commend uh, their work, and I know uh, Jay has provided some of that information. I commend everyone on this committee uh, for the work that they did. Uh, indicating that a positive school atmosphere is one of the greatest deterrents for students uh, to engage in illicit behavior. Uh, writ large, not just with drugs, but even other kinds, including uh, you know, sort of racial bigotry, um, vandalism, right? So a positive school environment benefits everyone. And I think random student drug testing um, creates an adversarial, structurally an adversarial relationship between students and teachers. When I went to school, there wasn't always the implicit assumption that students were our allies, right? There was a much more adversarial relationship back in the 80s. Um, I think that's changed over the last three decades uh, for the better. And I think now students properly see students, uh, they, the students see teachers being on their side. And I think that's better for everyone. I think everyone benefits from that, when students see teachers and administrators and others as on their side and being on their side in educating them, right? And I think structurally creating conditions that are necessarily adversarial would damage that uh, in some really, really trouble, troubling ways. And so I would argue also uh, against uh, drug testing because of that. Um, I, also, I also would argue that in addition to it not being the school district's responsibility, I definitely acknowledge that this is a very difficult conversation that people have with their children. Um, and it you know, for those who might argue that if the school board decides not to do this, that the school board is being cowardly, I would actually just address that for just one moment. It takes a great deal of courage to have these kinds of very difficult conversations with your child. I know, and I will speak just for myself, uh, that I have probably had more than one moment of, of cowardice uh, in struggling with these conversations with my own child, and so I definitely acknowledge that. But I think it improper that a parent would, in essence, subcontract that cowardice to a state agency, right? Which is, in essence, what would be happening. And I think it improper that parents cede or forfeit that primary obligation, similar to what Mitch said, to a state agency that has another obligation that I can't do. I can't teach my son chemistry. Right? I can't teach him high, you know, advanced literature, maybe in some ways, but not in the way that a teacher could uh, in, in Granville. I can't teach my son other subjects. The school can, and we have a great school, and I want to allow them to focus their energies and their resources on their primary obligation, and allow me to focus on my primary obligation, as difficult as it is. So those are the sum of my comments, and largely, again, in agreement with what they've said earlier. Thanks. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm Margo Singer, I live at 587 Bird Street. Um, I too am speaking uh, against the ma mandatory student drug testing proposal. And um, I just want to add a couple of things to what's already been said. I agree with everything that Mitch and, and Vivi have laid out. You know, I think that, um, again, just to repeat what Mitch said, we agree on the goal. And when I look at the survey data that, that you've put together, it seems to me that you can also look at that data as less a vote in favor of testing as much as sort of a referendum against drug use in general. Until I sort of got interested in this and started Googling things um, compulsively, I probably would have thought it was a perfectly reasonable thing to do. You hear about it in the news. Some people experienced it when they were in high school many years ago. It doesn't seem unreasonable. I think if people understood what the facts say and what the scientists have concluded, the academics that have studied it have concluded, that it simply really doesn't work and it's a lousy investment of 
twenty, thirty thousand dollars for a district that could really use that money to do a lot of important things. I'm not sure that those surveys would say what they say. Even at the forum where the exit survey, you know, admittedly it's a completely biased sample of whoever showed up that night with whatever agenda they had, we didn't really get into any of the details. I mean the presentation was great, but it was pretty quick. Jay waved his sheaf of studies at us, um, but it didn't really lay out the details. And in fact, in I think the good care that the committee took to sort of say, let's look at both sides of the issue, what wasn't said was that all the evidence skews the, the balance pretty strongly. The majority of, of well, of peer-reviewed academic studies out there, of work that the groups that Mitch cited has done, says that it's not, it's not uh, recommended. They haven't recommended the testing. So I guess um, I think that uh, we should be asking a different question, and that is what actually does work to reduce drug use. People are doing a lot of testing. It's not clear that they're getting much for their money. I read one survey that said that positive drug test costs in the end about $3,000 for that test because you only get one in 125 drug tests that are actually turn up positive on average in districts that have done this. So that doesn't seem like a great investment of what you could do with that money. Um, and again, near as I can tell, there are many programs out there that have been around for a long time that have been studied and that do work and that have a pretty substantial impact on kids' behavior and on the culture that Tom talked about while maintaining a positive um, culture within the school, a positive relationship between teachers. It's not a, a, a sort of prove <coughs> guilty kind of um, adversarial relationship between students and teachers. It puts more of the responsibility where it should be on families and helping families figure out what you do if your kid's using. Because um, I'm not sure that we all know. I don't know that I would know what to do. So I would say broaden the question and really look at uh, what does work and how that might or might not be implemented either in conjunction with drug testing or not. Um, nothing that I read said that the testing was a critical component of a multifaceted approach. Um, and I didn't see that anywhere. What I did see was a number of programs that didn't even mention testing once that have been demonstrated to work pretty well. And that's about all I know about them, but I would, I would want to look at those further. Thank you. Thanks, Margaret. Yes, I'll step forward to Jay Snyder, 2061 Jones Road. Um, so I wanted to thank the board and the administration, and Matt in particular, for everything that's been done in the course of all of this. And, Involving me from the outset and trying, I think, uh, very hard in the midst of the divisive issue to be very balanced and have a, a great look at this. And, and you know, it was a little bit challenging uh, over the course of that to be a minority representative for um, the argument against a mandatory system. Uh, but in the process of it, I learned a lot, and so it would be remiss in not saying some of what I learned. Um, as Mitch mentioned earlier, the American Academy of Pediatrics uh, recently restated their opinion against this practice on May 30th, 2015. Um, a separate study of opinions of medical professionals conducted in 2006 found that 86 were, 86% well, were opposed to mandatory in school testing. Um, we spoke to a few experts uh, who came to advise the committee as we looked at a couple of other things, including the opt-in testing, one of whom was Wayne Campbell of uh, Tyler's Light. He's the president of Tyler's Light. He lost his son to uh, drug use some years ago and has made it his mission to work on drug abuse prevention from that point forward. He too is opposed to mandatory uh, testing. Um, other various studies, you know, we. We did see in a lot of cases small, uh, you know, in some cases below the margin of terror uh, reductions in drug use. Frankly, when I came into this with the concerns that I had, I really still expected that mandatory drug testing would have a greater impact than what I found it to have. Uh, probably my largest surprise was that it was much less effective than even I, as somebody who suspected that there might be problems with it, 
um, ended up discovering that it actually was according to most of the research that was out there. Um, there was a federal program that started after the two uh, Supreme Court decisions, the first of which opened this up for athletes in, I believe, 1995. The second opened it up to a broader spectrum of students, which included uh, students who were participating in uh, other competitive extracurricular activities. It did not, um, it was never made clear that while some schools do have uh, testing for students that park at the school, that has never been fully litigated, uh, particularly at the Supreme Court level, and that is a concerning uh, aspect. But um, the, after those decisions came through, there was a federal government program to uh, have grants to continue to study this to see how effective it was. Um, those grants were taken back in 2008. Many, many districts that currently test were brought into the program based on the federal grants that were available through 2008. The studies that were associated with those grants um, did not meet the metrics that determine success. Um, again, the largest drug problem at Granville is alcohol. No method of testing has much likelihood of fixing that. There are two kinds of testing for alcohol. One can test for as much as 24 hours, one can test for as much as 72 hours, and the second kind dramatically increases the price of the test. Um, while this is a legal methodology, um, it was affirmed by two 5-4 decisions by the Supreme Court, and it continues to be opposed by many people and a lot of civil liberties organizations, and I'm concerned about the divisive nature of something like this. Um, certainly the majority, based on the survey, seem to support, but it is important to me um, that we remember that the last levy for Granville schools passed by the narrow margin that it did. And um, in relation to that cost, uh, we did some research as part of the committee on a testing panel, which included uh, a full alcohol test, marijuana, amphetamines, cocaine, heroin, prescription drugs, ecstasy, nicotine, and cost $107 per test. Uh, according to the numbers I found in the most optimistic survey that I could, uh, which was NCE 2010-4025, um, only one in 100 tests would come back positive. That would mean that each positive test result would cost $11,000 or very close to it. Uh, so I really do feel like there are some concerns about the efficacy versus the cost. Um, I do want to say that I really feel like the committee has been administered fairly, fairly um, and uh, I appreciate having been a part of it. Um, I also just wanted to say that I think I have found it in life very hard to find the right answers when you're not asking the right questions. And I feel like the impetus of this committee was to decide whether or not this particular policy would be effective at reducing drug use in Grandma. Uh, I'd like to see a start over. I'd like to see a start with the question of what can we do to best reduce drug use in Grandma? And I hope you'll consider it. Thanks. <coughs> Would anybody else like to address the board at this time? <coughs> no? Um, <coughs> okay. Um, I'd like to move on to um, board discussion of um, substance abuse at this time. Mm -hmm. And I will go ahead and um, sort of get things started. Um, uh, I do want to thank the committee very much for all the work you've done. It's been since January and we've thrown lots of questions at you. Um, but as many people have said tonight, I think um, we didn't charge you with the right question. Um, I think, and it wasn't really until, you know, you presented the research and other people presented research and showed that, you know, we were sort of missing a piece of the puzzle. We, um, you know, not sort of looking at a broader you know, how would drug testing be couched in something larger? Does it fit, does it not fit? Um, I, t 
to me, I, I agree with many of the statements that said, I think we're asking the wrong question. Not like, is drug, drug testing the right policy, but what is best? And so sort of taking a step back and finding out, you know, what that, um, what that best thing is um, for students. Um, and given all of the evidence um, that's been presented and the opinion of the American um, Academy of Pediatrics and, you know, the National Institute of, the drug, of drug Abuse um, and other um, institutions, um, I'm not convinced that in implementing a random drug testing program would move the needle the way we would like to see it moved. Um, I just think that's just the way the evidence is pointing. Um, I have a couple other um, thoughts, but I thought maybe um, on the, the sort of the broader issue, this issue of what the evidence is showing us, um, if other people want to um, jump in, that would be great, or I can you know, give them my other final thought. Um, but again, I do thank the committee, and um, um, I, you know, in hindsight, wish we had started with a broader, um, a broader question. But it's, I mean, you, you did what we asked you to do, and, and it's very much appreciated the time and the work that you put in. Um, so, with that, does anyone want to add, or? When did you finish your sentence? Um, my last, um, um, comment was to agree with m many of the comments that, that people had said that um, I don't know whether it's the district's job or responsibility um, to police what students are doing when they're not at school. Um, there are many um, types of risky behaviors, some illegal, that students participate in and we don't monitor those. We don't um, um, punish students for those kinds of things. And so, um, you know, if you extend the logic, why this, why this particular, I know it's, um, you know, a particularly um, scary topic. Um, there is a, um, a heroin addiction problem amongst young students, or young, young adults in, in Ohio, um, and that scares me um, a lot, which is sort of why I thought, you know, maybe, you know, the drug testing issue was the right issue to discuss at first. Um, but just given all of the evidence and the discussion that we've been having, um, um, I, I question, um, whether or not it's really the school's responsibility. I think um, monitoring substance use is largely a family responsibility for which the school should play a supporting role. Um, I think we should do what we can do to educate our students um, to make smart informed decisions about substance use, not just while they're in school, but what happens when they leave us. Are we preparing them to make these same kinds of important decisions once they leave school? And I don't think that a random drug testing program alone um, helps prepare students for once they leave um, our community. Um, and I'll leave it at that. I, I, I do believe that we can still have an impact on stuff, substance use, um, but I think we um, need to look further um, into other types of programs um, that have proven track records um, that may or may not include um, drug testing, preferably not. As someone who served on the committee, I didn't feel as though um, our charge were exclusively to discuss the pros and cons of drug testing, but to try to identify some way to change the culture. And I never considered that drug testing was the only um, option, nor that it could be successful as a standalone. It is a cultural issue. It is a community issue. It is parents and students and teachers and all of us. Uh, but the numbers are excessive, and the dangers to our kids are far more lethal than they were when we were students. They get the wrong mix of heroin and they're dead. They don't get that. They think they're invulnerable. Yes, it's the parent's job to keep them safe. I don't know that I disagree, no, I don't know that I do agree that it is not the school's responsibility though because we're talking about their participation in school activities 
we're not talking about exclusively punitive responses. We're talking about trying to identify kids who need help and trying to channel them into that help. I just, there are parents who are unaware, there are parents who are in denial, there are parents who are fully aware, but they need help too, because they may be doing everything they can for their child and still not be keeping them from indulging in risky behaviors. I don't see this as, as the only thing we need to do, but, and, and the argument that you get only one positive drug test out of 100 or 150 or however many, that doesn't tell you how many you might have gotten if you weren't testing. I, I don't know that you, you can examine the results that way. You can parse the results that way. Um, it needs to be in a community discussion, and I think we've been very upfront about that and, and invited as much input as possible. And if we're not trying to be parents, we're trying to support parents, we're trying to protect kids. Um, if someone has other ways to strengthen that, wonderful. Let's do them. But let's not just say, that we're giving up. Well, I don't say that, I don't think we're giving up. Well. I, I really don't. I think what we're saying, or at least what I'm saying, is that, yeah, this problem scares me. It, it should. Really it should. And you know, there's, there's, um, but I don't know that from all of the evidence that's been presented, I don't know that random drug testing is going to do what we want it to do or what we think it's going to do. There's no way for us to know how many people it um, deterred. Right. There's no way to measure that, right? Exactly. I mean, that's like the Homeland Security Department saying, look, no, no, no attacks. No attacks. Right. Look right. how good of a job we're doing, right? So, right. Exactly. Um, so it's really hard to know whether or not it would do any good. Um, or are we deterring students? And right. so I just think there's so many questions around it um, and other things that we haven't explored. Right. Now, as a committee, you may have discussed these things, that, but I don't know that it's been presented. Okay. Those kinds of things have been presented to us <coughs> um, at the board level. Right. Also, the concern that, that drug testing would sour the relationship between teachers and students I don't see as an issue because the teachers are not administering the drug test. It is an independent company that um, makes the, would make selections, does make selections where it is um, in use. It is not our administrators making any choices. Um, it's not choosing who gets it. It's, it's completely random and completely outside of the administration's control. That's a contracted thing. Um, so I, I don't necessarily see that it's going to, to affect those relationships or, or create suspicion. I agree with what, with Mitch's concern about confidentiality in the sense that this is a small actively networking community um, but isn't that part of the point to tip the culture so that it's not cool to do drugs or alcohol both of which are illegal and if you get caught, there should be some teeth, some treatment, some help. Not the presumption right now. The the at the at the forum, some of the students who were there said the perception is that there are effectively no consequences if you get caught now. 
that's not the culture we want, is it? The perception that it's okay? I feel a little, okay, we've kind of kicked this ball around down the road a little bit to get to here, and I don't know if it's officially been an agenda item over the last couple of years, but I've heard community conversations about it that sort of have kept getting delayed. So I'm glad that we took the time and pushed things up to have this active conversation, and I think we had a good turnout last week that we um, got a sampling of the community's perspective. Um, and the numbers of the Pride Survey are, I guess, surprising and a little alarming to me, right? And I think it's especially alarming because I would guess that if you were to survey the parents, right, there would be different percentages, right? So the parents, you know, are probably likely unaware in most cases of the substance abuse that their children are doing. And I, um, in many ways, I don't have a concern with some type of drug testing from a um, uh, privacy perspective, I, I don't have a concern from a cost perspective, it's a significant cost, right? but I think it's a worthy one if it can make a difference. I'm not convinced based on the evidence and the research that it can make a difference alone, right? but this dichotomy between the usage that's shown in the surveys and the perspective that the community has come forth with um, about concerns and many people on the survey and at the meeting and things like that have expressed a need to do something different. And I've heard many times that our, you know, our current policy is kind of a joke. I've heard it from coaches, I've heard it from students and things, right? And I think we need to do something, whether it be in policy or in culture, more importantly. Like, I don't, I don't necessarily think that the, the policy leads the culture. I think the policy is a reflection of that. And I think that our policy needs to reflect the value of the community, just like our, our education does in our curriculum. It's not just the state-mandated thing. It's what, you know, we as Granville decide is important. So I don't necessarily have a problem with it, but I have a concern that it's not effective by itself. I have a concern about kicking the ball any further down the road, right? And I've heard um, some questions about, you know, if there's a mandatory student drug testing program, we might ha not have kids in the extracurriculars that are effective protective factors. But I also know that our extracurriculars are sources of proliferation of abuse. And I've heard many firsthand stories from students that there's use that happens after matches and games and plays and things like that. So I don't know how we can address that culturally, right, through our coaching staff, through our, you know, extracurricular leaders and things as well, because I think we need to have a more effective education, not just of, you know, the details that are taught by outside sources, but of truly an appreciation of the impact of more significant addiction. Right, and to the extent that earlier use can lead to more significant addiction, I think there's a strong <coughs> correlation there, right, that I think we owe it to our kids. Many community members feel they owe it to our kids to find a way to educate and push off that decision or have it be made at a time when they can think clearly about it, think with parents about it. I'm not sure if, if we can assume that we'll be able to push that out forever, right, but at the same time, the, the the dichotomy between the Pride survey results and what, what the community would have said on the same kind of survey about their own children is alarming to me. And maybe that means that you know an opt-in kind of program is an effective piece of a larger program. Um, so I'm not firmly decided one way or the other on this or not. I don't think that you know voting today or in some near term on a mandatory random stu student test alone is going to do it. Right, but I'm not opposed to that if the committee and, and we as a board feel that that's an important piece of, important component of a culture change. Okay, thanks. I, um, for me, I just have so many questions in my head swimming about actual implementation of this program. I think we need to know what we're gonna do punitively when kids have problems, what we're gonna teach them about the problems before it happens. Um, and I know we have a real problem. I was just talking with a recent graduate who said she went to a party, opened the door, and there were lines of cocaine on the kitchen counter for her to enjoy with her friends. So it's a real issue here, but I don't know that we have the timeline set to make it happen before the school year starts. I think if, if we have a policy in place, it's gotta be from soup to nuts. We have to be ready to go, and we have to know exactly what it is because it can't be kind of formed once the first kid pops test negative and we don't know what to do, or positive and we don't know what to do. So. Um, my concern is that the timeline is off 
completely and that I go back to Jen's thing of maybe we've asked the wrong question and maybe we looked a little not large enough into how do we stop the larger program but we went straight to uh, yes or no to mandatory testing and I think parents at the uh, community forum were saying the same had the same issues of why are we so specific on mandatory testing or not without asking about how we're addressing a larger issue within the community so I sit here with a million questions that I don't think in a month and a half we will be able to get in place before this school starts but I think we have a base ready to move to really work on prevention through our health programs and things like that so. thank you um, I, it's been said already but um, for the committee that did the work um, the administration has done the work and the folks who have turned out tonight to speak very uh, persuasively thoughtfully about it I, I, and I think we're I know we're all grateful for that um, I wish we weren't talking about this I, I wish it wasn't an issue um, the pride survey persuades me that it is a bigger issue than I think I had expected it to be which is interesting because I've heard anecdotally from kids and other folks in the community for a while now that it's a bigger issue than I than I know and I always kind of including with my own kids that but the pride survey is, is pretty compelling and it's not just a one snapshot in time it's consistent over a long period of time um, I guess I'll speak to a couple of issues um, it, my framework on this, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm glad, Amy, that um, you were on the committee and, and um, you expressed the view that you, know, you didn't feel, at least, that, that it was a yes or no for testing, but for other things uh, to be considered. Um, probably almost two years ago now, I had a conversation with uh, one of our high school varsity coaches uh, who shall go unnamed, a person who's been a very successful coach a uh, successful parent, as best I can tell, who said, um, there are kids I can't reach and I know that something's going on because behavior changes from one season to the next. And I think you should look hard at drug testing. And what he said was, I think it may save a kid's life. And, and really I have always come back to that statement and there's no scientific basis for it it's not supported by a number of things it's his it's his perspective as a coach interacting on a regular basis with high school students it may save a kid's life um, and I can't get away from that uh, I don't think this is for me anyway as Thomas had indicated, not so much an issue of privacy. Look, there are a lot of Supreme Court cases that um, that I would disagree with, and maybe the Earl's case would be one of them, but it is settled law, and um, it's permitted. Um, and so I look at it as an option for us to consider as we're trying to address what's become a larger problem. Um, um, there are two other points that are that are persuasive that were made tonight. One that um, one about efficacy, uh, about uh, many of the studies, perhaps most of the studies, have indicated uh, no significant improvement in um, have indicated not not a significant difference in in the rate of usage. The American um, Association of Pediatrics. American Academy of Pediatrics um, is, is pretty definitive, but but they also cited a study um, by uh, DuPont, which I read, um, the American Society of uh, of Addiction Medicine, uh, who, who does say. Um, that there is strong evidence in their study that um, kids who knew they were likely to be tested uh, 
cut their usage in a significant manner. Um, I don't know, I certainly haven't read every study out there. I don't by any means have an exhaustive knowledge of what the, the data says. I have an intuition that says if, um, if I'm participating in an activity and I like that activity and want to keep participating in that activity, that I'm not going to do something to jeopardize my eligibility. One of the things that I've always felt was important about extracurriculars, whether it's <coughs> on the stage, in the, in the music room, on the playing field, or the, or the court, um, was the teamwork. The responsibility that one undertakes to his or her teammates um, and returns to those teammates. And I think that's really powerful with young people. I think it's very, very compelling. And part of what I think I'd like to see us try to accomplish is um, to leverage that. I don't want kids to decide they don't want to participate in sports or music or drama or clubs. I want kids to say, uh, you know, I have an obligation to do my best to be my best. And, um, and whether I'm afraid of failing a drug test or whether I just decide it's not a good thing to do, I want to I wanna make sure that, I, that my behavior is appropriate. I think, I think there's something there. I don't think that necessarily shows up in the data. I don't know that it shows up in the data. As, as folks have discussed here, we don't know who's saying no because of this. I know that students have approached folks in, in the administration in the past and said, I wish that you would have some sort of drug testing program because it would, it would give me cover to say no. It will help me um, evade some of the peer pressure that, uh, that happens, and I, you know, I can point to that. And if it only is for one kid out of 125 test results, that's enough for me. Um, the other argument, which is I find also very compelling, which is that it's not the school's responsibility. It shouldn't be. I wish it, wish it wasn't, and ultimately it isn't. But there's something we can do. You know, we, as an educational system, we spend a lot of time talking to kids about healthy choices, about lifestyle choices, about being fit. We spend time and money educating them and informing them on distracted driving. Um, we all, as parents, and, and educators wish that we could wrap our arms around the kids all the time so that when they're in their car driving down the road without adult supervision, they're mindful and careful, and, but we know they're not, not in every case. We wish when they went to social events, they were protected and we could wrap our arms around them. We can't. Uh, but nevertheless, we strive to help them make those choices about what they eat, about their level of fitness, about how they drive, about not texting while driving, about respecting the opposite sex, about good citizenship. We layer onto that um, expectations that, uh, that we place upon students who participate in extracurricular activities um, that are related to good citizenship and making good choices and not doing things that we'd like them not to do. Um, you know, it's been said before, it's, a, you know, it's not a right, it's a privilege to participate in those things, and part of that is earned through behavior. Uh, again, I don't want to see us discourage anybody from participating, but, but the standards have to matter. Uh, we had a speaker who came before us, it wasn't the last meeting, but the meeting before when we were talking about this, someone who's been involved um, with local courts and drug testing and the like, and his comment to us was, you know, actions have consequences. And um, if you don't have consequences, um, you can make all the rules, you can have all the regulations, you can do everything you want, but it's not, it's not gonna be effective. Um, and so I, uh, while I wish it wasn't our responsibility, and I freely acknowledge it is not our, it is not primarily our responsibility, and, and no matter what we do, if parents are permissive or, um, or otherwise benignly ignorant about it, we're not going to save every kid. We're not going to prevent usage in every instance. 
but I think there are a lot of good kids out there who need help, who want help. Ultimately, I look at this as an opportunity for intervention, and, and that gets to our core mission as an educational body. Some of the comments tonight, I, I think maybe conflated testing and punishment. And those are two very separate and significant differences. And, and like Thomas, I think we have to look at both of them separately. If we decided to, to do the testing, what are the consequences of a failed test? Um, how punitive do we make that? Um, or do we make it punitive at all? Or is it simply an intervention to get the kid into, into um, some sort of, the child into some sort of program to help? Uh, and that's a, a question that's unresolved in my mind that I, that I would hope we would continue to look at. Um, and, and the literature that I've read seems to indicate that, you know, that, that there ought to be differences. Look, we have an existing policy in place that, um, I've heard kids say the same thing, it's a joke. I mean, you, to, to get caught violating our current policy, you really have to, you, re, you really have to be very careless and negligent. We should tighten up our current policy, um, separate and apart from testing. We should make sure that the consequences of violations of that policy are significant, keeping in mind privacy rights of, of kids and their families. Um, and I also think we have to look at testing as a component of everything else. And, and um, there, there's a lot of good uh, information that's come to us recently. I know, Matt, you've done a lot of work. I know a lot of folks in the community have done a lot of work um, on some of the life skills training programs and, and, and other options that are out there. And I, and I want us to look carefully and thoughtfully at at those as well because the literature does say that whatever you do a standalone test isn't going to make the difference it has to be part of a comprehensive <coughs> holistic approach um, it, it, it's not a and, and so I want to do what we can do to empower and enable and give provide skills to, to kids to be able to to say no it's not a, it's not a matter of whether people know it's it's something they shouldn't do. I mean, the pride survey says nine out of 10 kids know their parents wouldn't approve, right? Um, yet there's a there's a peer-to-peer, -peer, um, there's less significance in the peer-to-peer. -peer. So we have to, we have to address that. <coughs> but I would like us to press forward. I would encourage us to press forward, to look at random testing. I don't know yet whether, uh, I haven't yet concluded whether I think those results ought to go only to the parents for the first time or whether they ought to go to, to the schools. If, if what we're trying to do, if we really believe that, that 9 out of 10 kids believe their parents disapprove and we, and we provide that early intervention opportunity to parents, we may, see some, we may see some success there. I don't know how we structure that. I'm not smart enough to figure that out, but others here are. Um, but I think we have to take every tool available to us, educationally, um, testing, um, everything we can to try and intervene with kids. And I don't want us to become a police state. It, this is not about, it's not about pure punishment. It's about intervention. What I want is for us to intercede or help the family intercede with a child who's using substances before the police do, or worse, before the coroner does. I think we have to do something. Would you mind if I jumped into the conversation? Okay. Um, First of all, I live with the General Assembly who make decisions in a vacuum and policy quickly. Um, I can tell you that we have been watching this conversation about the Pride Survey for about five years, although we've just only recently entertained, okay, now what are we going to potentially do to move the needle? Um, so 
I think it's important for us to realize that you know, when you're dealing with a polarizing topic like this, what you're trying to do is maximize the positives and minimize the negatives. And I think you are squarely in that conversation um, as a Board of Education. And I applaud you for having the conversation. I applaud the community for having and modeling a rich dialogue about a difficult topic. Um, it's not easy to sit down with your, your child and talk to them about substance abuse or sex education, it, but it's your obligation as a parent, okay? Um, my, my graduation speech was, it's not in loco parentis, it's in cunitio parentis, which is, you know, not in place of parent, but in combination with parent. And I think we're wrestling with that dichotomy or that difference. So, um, I think you're heading in the right direction as far as exploring other options available to us. But I think one of the things I would suggest is that we actually talk about the policy that was talked about in the, in the committee. We haven't really done that as a board to talk about the soups to nuts conversation to give you a broader perspective of what would a policy actually look like from start to finish with some of the nuances and details because um, that might help again shape your thinking about what type of policy and that and and you can make the decision whether it goes to the administration or it goes to the parents or that we don't do it at all and we stick to education you can still make that decision later down the road but I think the next logical step might be to talk about the actual policy that was discussed in the committee uh, because I think that that we've talked around it but we haven't talked specifically about it so I'd like to make that recommendation for the next board meeting that we need to set a date for don't let me forget um, and I think um, we modeled this conversation a long time with bullying as well um, and we had a we had a bullying forum we had about 30 people show up they told their stories and we talked a little bit about it and then we made some subtle shifts in the way that we did business um, one of them mainly being that we eliminated parent monitors on playgrounds who didn't really know kids and we put teachers out there and it had a dramatic shift in the numbers and so we're still looking for that what is that thing that's going to have uh, make the first shift and in that cultural change that you're talking about and I think whether it's education or some type of random drug testing policy we're still in search of that and but there is no magic bullet okay it's about incremental change towards a common goal and so we're working our way through that and I appreciate I appreciate the committee, I appreciate the, the community's feedback. Um, this is what a governing body is designed to do. And, and yes, it does take a little bit of time. And um, I too have concerns about how to get to implementation quickly. Um, because I know when you do things quickly, you make mistakes. And I don't really want to make mistakes in this. But I also want to move the needle sooner rather than later. Um, but as I talk with my administrative team, sometimes you have to go slow to go fast. And that's frustrating. That's very frustrating. So we can't all be Michaela's and just be fast. <laughs> so um, we have to really be intentional. I think you're on, on the right road. And I know that the administration um, sometimes gets frustrated with the position that they're put in when you know maybe we have to be in more in place than parents than in combination and and we get frustrated by that on a regular basis and we want to make sure that we we are thoughtful about moving forward so that's my two cents um, but I am looking for direction as far as the next step so if you could provide that that would be helpful <clears throat> Do we want to hear more from the public before we give you direction, or <clears throat> do you want us to give you direction? 
there is additional public comment mm -hmm. around the, the agenda. Um, that is up to you. Uh, I'm not sure quite like, I, I guess what would be helpful is having like a couple of options, like straw men, like possibilities, right? Mm -hmm. Proposing a spectrum of things potentially. So maybe that's something that the committee would be willing to like look at and propose both ends of the spectrum and some things in between. I don't know if this is kind of a compromise situation that we're looking for. We're looking for the right situation, right? And, and uh, maybe there's even an opportunity for like a working session or something where we can continue to converse around that and kick ideas back and forth. Um, but, you know, I'm not sure how far we, away we are from coming up with some plans and some ideas or even a, a, a change in a policy to some extent, right? And I'm not sure that we need to delay much further because I think we've heard great from the community in many different ways, right? And I think putting some things out there sort of in black and white might help us, like, oh, that's not gonna be right. Or, you know, maybe that's something that we can all get our minds around. And I'm not sure if, if we're to that point yet where we can put that on the committee or on you to kind of help us craft that, or if you'd rather have, you know, our direct input in some kind of working session where we can do that, or even individually. Mm -hmm. You know, we could maybe provide some things or some ideas or get you a better sense of it. Um, I was going to say, I, I think we're pretty far from implementing a um, drug, random drug testing. I think there are, are too many questions around how it would work and um, <clears throat> how you fund it and how, how, um, you know, how you measure the effectiveness of it and things like that for it to happen by, we would really have to approve it in July and our July meeting is before July 10th. So that would give you two weeks. That's correct. To put all of those details in place. <clears throat> That's not to say that we can't look at our existing thing, our existing policy, and as you said, Russ, tighten it up and reevaluate it for this year. Um, um, we can discuss <clears throat> could we implement something, a change halfway through the year? Um, we've discussed before. I think that we don't like that idea because then it just you know, it, you know. The fall winter sports <clears throat> are not affected by it, but then the spring is. Um, but it, it's a possibility. Um, um, I I think we need to take a look, like you said, at our existing policy. What is it that we can change about it? Um, you can certainly propose a random drug testing thing, but I don't think that we're going to be able to pull all those details together, particularly if it has to be couched um, for success in a, um, a broader context of, you know, culture change and education. And um, I don't know that our education program right now is the wraparound that a random drug testing program. I don't know that that's the successful atmosphere for if, yeah. if, if we were to do. We, we have policies, existing policies that they've reviewed that are more standalone, so to speak, um, as far as an in-depth wraparound conversation that has not been vetted by the committee. Is that accurate, Matt? Okay. So, so I think you're making an accurate statement. Um, I think if you were if you were to charge the administration with coming with a random drug testing policy, we could get it done before August 1. It would probably require a work session and a special meeting in, in late July. But again, given the context of the conversation, is that what you're looking for? Um, I think there are four, four items. Um, three of them are very care closely related to your question and Dr. Warren's comment about timing. Uh, the, to me, the, the first one, which is unrelated, is looking at our existing policy and what are we, what are we proposing to do under that policy that doesn't have random drug testing. Uh, for violations of that policy. And I, I know that's something that's been the subject of discussion. I don't know how far along it is, but I, I suspect there's some pretty well-formed thoughts and opinions on changes that, that 
you might recommend there. That to me is, you know, something we can, as soon as you're ready, we should do it. We okay. should look at it. Um, in terms of, in terms of moving forward on random drug testing, with either the school getting the results or the parents getting the results or the alternative, which is not implementing random drug testing. Um, I am not opposed to having a work session and community. The issue is, <laughs> the issue is uh, front and center for us. So, um, you know, I think folks are fully engaged and I hate to lose that engagement. Um, it puts a lot of, a uh, lot on the plate of the administration to try and uh, bring that to us. Um, I don't, I don't know that I would look at it, while I uh, firmly believe it, if we did testing, it has to be part of an overall program. I also know that we also, we currently have some curriculum in place. We need to look at that curriculum and decide where the opportunities are to approve that curriculum. Um, I don't, I don't necessarily think that we have to wait on a decision about whether or not we do drug testing and what it would be with that curriculum, but I'd like to know, I'd like to get a sort of a, a, a good appraisal for where we think there is room to improve in the curriculum. I don't, I guess I, what I'm saying is I don't think that's a six month process mm -hmm. on the curriculum, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. right. Um, so, and, and while I'm not opposed, um, it's not optimal, I'm not opposed to a mid-year change in policy on if we decided to move forward with drug testing, um, you know, it's obviously better if we did it at the start of a year. Um, if we don't do it at the start of this year, I would not be necessarily dug in on waiting until next year. I'd like to do it. If we're going to do it, I'd like to do it. Assume we can come to an agreement on it, do it sooner rather than later. So I'm in favor of moving forward with all of these things as quickly as you can, and, and the administrative team can present them to us, mm -hmm. uh, and we can have time to debate them and consider them. Yeah, I think yeah. at this point we do need something concrete to discuss, yeah. um, rather than sort of right. that, this is and, and so if you know, like, I think if in the next couple of weeks we can find a way to get calendars to synchronize, why not have a working session now as opposed to October? You know, mm -hmm. I mean, it seems like we've got momentum here. Right, and I don't know what again schedules and calendars are like, or what the commitment would be to kind of propose a couple things. We're certainly not looking for a finished policy. I think we're looking for a way that we can kick around ideas and get our mind around some of these details, mm -hmm. both in uh, testing possibilities and what those could be, as well as curricular. You know what we do now, because I'm a little uneducated on what our current status is, and what you know best practices could be, or what we might propose moving forward. So, I would recommend because. Our July regular meeting will be um, more action item related to personnel because of the July 10th deadline. But we could put together a presentation about the policy that was discussed. That could be a brief conversation. And then I would recommend a work session shortly after that, um, maybe the third week of July, depending on people's schedules, to have a a deeper dive into the conversation. The work sessions after the meeting or before the meeting? <coughs> that would be after okay. the meeting. So people would have a chance to look at the policy that yeah. that is constructed right now, ask a lot of questions, and then go into, and we could pull together some information about um, any enhancements to the curriculum, um, it, I mean, it will be a short time period, and you know, it's it's July, so um, I want to be realistic, but but I think at a minimum, we could actually discuss the policy that was discussed in the committee, and then do a work session more broadly. Is that what you're advocating? So, okay. mm -hmm. yeah. And I could bring back the existing policy in July as well, because that 
we've already talked about that right. prior to. Okay. Um, the challenge with the existing policy was from the coaching staff that said, you know, don't up the ante without having some other type of mechanism to drive the conversation about whether kids are violating or not because it's so very difficult to actually apply our policy because it's almost direct knowledge sure um language i i guess you know i don't want to spend time on it now but i i sort of disassociate those two mm -hmm. penalties for violations now ought to be whatever we think they should be versus whatever consequences we might determine In um, if we do some sure. other sort of Okay. So existing policy and potential policy review in the July meeting and then a work session in July. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. If we can pull together a <laughs> slot for Thank July you. again with people going and so forth and so our expectations are not we'll for finality, but we'll we will figure it out. All the more chances we have to talk about this, the better and get continued feedback. Do we need to go ahead and look at calendars now? Um, that would be, if we wanted to set the actual board meeting date, that would be great. Um, so for the July meeting, I'm actually going to propose that we meet potentially on July 8th, uh, which is a Friday, because July 10th is over the weekend. Mm -hmm. So that would be my proposal is, is any, and that can be a day meeting, that can be an evening meeting. I don't really, it's a Friday evening, so I'd, I think a day meeting would make more sense. But. Mm -hmm. okay. Friday meeting? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But that's fun. Okay. Uh, what time? Evening is much better for Evening is May. better. Evening's better for you? Yeah. Okay. Five o'clock work for you? Or does it need to be later? Uh, I don't care. care. I'm just nothing before five. Five o'clock? Five thirty? Whatever yeah, yeah whatever I'm, works. I'm totally fine. I'm, I'm open. Yeah. Totally yeah. I can't so think pick. what camps are that yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You want to say six thirty? But I'm sure there are some. We could do our six thirty traditional time, right? Or whatever. That's a little late on Friday evening for some, but six sounds good. Six o'clock? Six yeah. o'clock on Friday. Like, are you okay with that? Hmm? Are you okay with that? Um, I've never. <laughs> <laughs> and work session? Yeah. So we said six. six. Saying third week, the week of the 18th. Is that where you're thinking? Yeah, I was thinking the week of the 18th. And I would say Tuesday or Thursday are best in that week for me. Thursday's better for me. The 21st? Mm -hmm. Okay. And are we talking the evening is again for the work session? Okay. Six. Okay. Six thirty or six. Okay. Six. And that will be a work session. This time we'd like to entertain a uh, second session of public comments. Um, this time you can feel free to comment on um, any topic that we have discussed before or otherwise. <coughs> so if you'd like to address the board, please come to the podium and... I just want to offer um, an observation and a suggestion in light of your next steps. 
Um, my observation is that the discussion that I just listened to um, seems to uh, be emotional rather than based in the facts that are readily available out there. And I sympathize with your emotions, okay? It would be great if drug testing would save a kid's life. It would be great if it would change the culture in the school and reduce drug use. But I just want to repeat, having spent you know, quite more time than I expected the last week reading a lot of the stuff, that that is not what it does. It would be nice if it did, but it doesn't. The American Academy of Pediatrics studied all the studies that are out there about this issue and concluded that it doesn't work. They're not recommending testing in conjunction with education. They're recommending against testing because it doesn't work and it's a bad investment for school districts. So I urge you to read those studies yourself more carefully and to try to separate the emotion that we all feel from the reality of drug testing. Um, one positive test in 125 doesn't mean that anyone's life has been saved from addiction. It means some kid, it most likely means, because most drug use in high schools is sporadic and experimental, it most likely means that some good kid who smoked pot for the first time at a party got busted. And that his friends who don't do any extracurricular activities and party far more frequently aren't going to get tested ever. And is that the environment you want to create in our schools? It's not one that I want to create. It's an environment of fear, and it's not a, it's not a great use of, of up to $11,000 or whatever the number was. 3,000, according to the study that I saw. So I think if you can, you know, as, as a committee and as the board, try to separate the very human and under, understandable emotion from what the facts are telling us about drug testing, that would be, um, I think, really important. Um, I applaud the next steps. I think looking at what we currently do on the education front is important. I think it's inadequate from what my kids have told me. Um, my sense is that there are other programs out there that are much more useful. I have no idea what they are or what they would cost. I don't think we've heard any conversation about that at all, either in the previous board meetings that I watched the videos of or at last week's forum. And I think that the policy, as you've already said, I, I've never heard in any public forum any details about what you're actually talking about. I think you need to figure out the mechanics. I don't know what it would cost to bring in an outside group to stand in the stalls and, and collect urine samples from the kids. I think it would be very expensive to have personnel coming in from outside the school to test the kids. And if it's not outside personnel from a third party, then I would think it's got to be the faculty, the teachers in the school, and that has issues. I'd like to know the cost. I'd like to know what the consequences are. I'd like to know what, you know, Russ said uh, the point is to get kids into programs to help. Most of the studies that I read said that's a nice idea. Most boards want that to happen, and it doesn't happen. So what, I don't know what programs are even out there, and do they help? Do they help the kid that just, you know, try drugs for the first time or uses sporadically, or not? The, what I thought was most compelling about the stuff that I read, it said that Educational programs need to address the psychology of adolescents and the social environments that they're in, in a particular community. And testing has no part in that. So I would urge you to study that. I think uh, from my background as a consultant going through these kinds of processes, getting the facts and studying them thoroughly is really, really helpful. And it probably takes a fair amount of time. It can help to have Outside groups bring that information to you in a, in a synthesized way. It's hard to do in a working session or in, in a meeting like this. But that's what I would recommend. Thank you. <coughs> so just very quickly, um, there was a, a great deal of discussion by the board about the concept of culture. And fortunately, um, I have expertise in this, uh, being a professor of anthropology, specializing in culture, along with linguistic and archaeology. Um, policies don't necessarily change a culture. They might, but not in the way that you might imagine. Right? And I think a policy that would create a culture of surveillance would create a culture that is detrimental to the main cultural sort of attributes that a, an educational institution has, and that's to educate. Uh, what 
decades of anthropological as well as sociological research indicates is that when institutions are charged with leveraging their greatest attributes and the greatest assets, that's when cultures begin to change, right? They actually change in the interstices of those close social relations that people have among each other, uh, that friends have with each other, kin groups, that's the primary place, that's the great genitor, the generator of all cultural changes actually in, in family groups. Um, but even in other sort of larger institutions, um, what the, the school has at its, within its ambit is to educate and to use a fairly blunt instrument to penetrate students' bodies to extract, in essence, a confession, right, is, I think, a, a, a difficult way to imagine that that would be in the best interests of an educational institution. What they can do, and, and uh, just revisiting the current policy and revisiting uh, the current educational sort of program he has, that we have in place and going along with uh, a, a mandatory drug test uh, policy is, I, I think, a, a failure of imagination, of educational imagination. And I would love to see a much more robust uh, examination of more innovative, uh, more engaging forms of education, because that's what the schools do better than anyone else. Right? They educate. They do that better than anyone else. They're not as good at surveillance, and I don't think it's their responsibility still, uh, you know, with all respect to Russ said and he acknowledged that as well. Um, but their greatest attribute is to educate. Right? That's their greatest uh, attribute, and I would encourage a much, much more sort of robust examination of that. If people say, well, the education doesn't work, I, I would acknowledge that. That could very well be the case, but you don't get rid of education. Right? You come up with new, more innovative, more engaging forms of education, right? but you don't do away with education. You try to come up with better forms of education. And that's really what the school, I think their largest sort of responsibility is that. And again, I would submit that they do that better than anyone else in the community. And so I would ask them to invest their resources in better educational practices. Um, and I haven't really heard much of that discussion. And I, would be, I think that would take some time. I think it would take some time to do it well. If we want to be an elite school district, we should be educating better than anyone else. Not surveilling bodies better than anyone else. Right? That's again, that's a, a failure of imagination. But we can educate better than anyone else. I actually believe the community has the resources to do that in ways that maybe other communities don't. And so I would uh, suggest that that would be the best option uh, going forward. Thanks. I'm sorry, I will try to be brief. Um, I would obviously echo what my friends have said. Um, but I, I have three things I'd like to say in response to, to what you have said. First, there was a lot of conversation among the board's discussion, which I thought was a terrific discussion. But there was a lot of conversation about this 1 in 100, 1 in 150 statistic and I, I, about the number of the ratio of successful drug tests. And I want to clarify why that's important. It isn't a question of money. And somebody said, I think it was you, Russ, and I agree a thousand percent, that you would pay any price to, to if it's only, even if it's only one kid whose life you can save. And I agree completely. Understand the importance of the one in a hundred statistic is this. If we catch one percent of the people that we test, but we know from all studies that the percentage of kids using drugs is extraordinarily higher than that, it shows you how the program doesn't work. Now, I don't know, someone at the table probably knows uh, the, the studies that you've done, what percentage of our kids have admitted to using some of these illegal substances. Well, if that percentage is 20, 30, 40, 50 percent, and, and we assume it's similar nationally, if we're catching 1 percent or less than 1 percent, then what that demonstrates for you is the program simply doesn't work. Um, the second thing I would say is, again, in response to you, Russ, and I thought that was a, an eloquent plea, and I'm absolutely sympathetic to you. I have three kids. Um, I, I agree. You want to just wrap them up and keep them safe, and it's, it's the most important thing. But you, you sort of made my argument about the slippery slope, I think. You talked about, we want to tell them, don't text and drive. And we have programs in the school so they don't do that. Yeah, but we don't punish them when they do. Right? It's, it's, if we're going to start ranking a hierarchy of what is dangerous to our kids and the society around them, I would actually submit texting while driving is really, really high. So I guess I'm urging the board then, if you're going to start testing for drugs, we're going to have to start taking kids out of extracurriculars because they're texting and driving? Are we going to start doing other things that um, impede upon what I think is a family and um, uh, immediate circle issue and not something that is tied to the broader function of the school? Um, last but not least, and, and this is kind of troubling to me in, in when I listen to you talk about how you want to proceed from here, because I think, honestly, you're doing it emotionally and somewhat illogically, to sort of echo what Margot said. All of the studies, and, and I think Matt said this, and Matt, I'm, I'm going to defer to you right now. All of the studies that Matt, that I looked at and Matt indicated when he came up here indicate that random drug testing on its own doesn't work. And, and that's exactly what you said. That it needs to be wrapped in this all-encompassing program if it's going to work. But what you have all just said 
uh, if I understand the majority view, is that you want to go forward with a random drug testing program, or at least discuss those options, while in the meantime, that all-encompassing program is, is kind of being developed as an afterthought. So you might start with one in September, which is clearly not going to be enough time for us to correlate it to any sort of curricular changes or larger changes that are going on. And I would submit that all the evidence suggests that doesn't work. If every study suggests that random drug, drug testing on its own, when it's not carefully connected to an all-encompassing system of support and education and other things that are specifically tied to the message that you are trying to send, it's specifically tied, I imagine, to the community and the background of your students, then the program's simply not going to work. And every study says that. So it seems to me, as a suggestion, the best way to proceed is not to say, Yes, let's go forward and put together a specific plan for random drug testing and at the same time start thinking about the curricular changes. Let's do it together. Put a committee together and charge them with, uh, with putting together an all-encompassing larger program. And maybe that takes a year to design, but something that emphasizes everything from the social and the cultural and the educational components and as a smaller part of that, the random drug testing, rather than push forward with one and put the other as sort of a secondary effect. So uh, that's my suggestion. And again, thank you. <clears throat> All right, since everyone else. Oh, <laughs> um, first of all, I'd like to say that I don't envy the situation that you're in. I mean, once a ball gets rolling, it, especially one with this much weight, it develops inertia. And certainly there's an inertia to this conversation. And, you know, I can see that in. Uh, the, the difficulty that you're having in trying to figure out, you know, okay, what do we do with this one here? Seventy percent of the community is saying, yeah, let's do this. Well, I get it. You know, you're in a situation where now seventy percent of the community said, let's do this, and yet the reality is that it's not the easiest thing to do, and I guarantee you that a lot of those people haven't read all that all of us have read. Um, now, I guess what I would offer to a certain extent is one of the things that we discussed in the committee a lot that really hasn't come up very much because it really wasn't as enthusiastically received on the survey in no small part, uh, partly because of the leading aspects to the question, uh, I think, in the way that it was phrased, uh, and if anyone wrote that question, I apologize. Um, but was the opt-in program. Now, the opt-in program, nobody's going to say that this is going to do anything miraculous. I mean, it is likely that it could help some child at some point or another. And it's a lot less likely that it could harm them. And that's why over the course of it, I've come to have a bit of support for the opt-in program. There's a, and I have a couple of things that I just happen to have in my folder that I bring along to all these things about that. If anybody wants to see those, I'm sure Matt has a ton of the stuff about it. But um, there's a particular thing called the Drug Free Clubs of America. What happens is that students or the parents of students can sign up to opt into random drug testing. And um, by doing so, they receive benefits like maybe good parking space that's reserved for them or um, discounts at local hamburger shops, whatever it may be. And one of the, some of the benefits that I've seen of it, because we talk about culture, and one of the conversations that came up was, you know, what we want to do is shift the culture. And I think that a lot of what's been said about the adversarial and top-down nature of the mandatory process really comes into play when you can say that what we're doing is trying to make non-use more visible. By opting into this program, by parking in a particular space, by being able to get a discount in front of another kid that doesn't get that discount, then you're making non-use visible. It has some impact. What you're trying to do is say, we only see a 42% peer response to, you know, is drinking uh, alcohol or, you know, having uh, an interaction with, you know, any sort of illicit substance. Um, something that your peers will react negatively to. And, you know, 
if they don't change that, then it's all for naught. I mean, eventually, they're going to leave this community. They're going to leave the surveillance system that we put in place. What they need is to change that number. You know, if you're going to see uh, an actual movement. And so, while um, I don't think it's anything perfect, uh, I don't think anything is perfect. And at the end of the day, there will be pressure for something to be done. Uh, I would highly encourage a look at this program. It's something that doesn't have to be implemented at the beginning of the school year necessarily. Uh, it's something that I don't think, I mean, it's a club. I don't think the board needs to approve any changes to anything for it to exist. I may be wrong about that. Um, but I think it's, it is one of those things where uh, it could do something about the culture. Coaches could encourage their students to be a part of it. Um, I don't know. I, again, I don't think anything's perfect. I'd like to see us go back to the question of what is the best thing. But we've talked a lot about this, and everyone wants it. It's here. Thanks, Jeff. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. That's all right. Um, so my name is Brad Bess. Uh, still residing at 1405 East Road. And um, president of Music Boosters. And uh, we're totally going to switch gears here. So let's picture we're coming out of the Mario tube into a new world, OK? Um, <laughs> so um, if you don't know, I'm a thief. And so I love stealing other people's materials. <laughs> and if you know I'm talking to you, it's going to be talking about music music boosters in particular and I, you know you guys are all great about talking about the partner groups that help support Granville schools and we're certainly one of those so I thought I'd just begin um, with something I heard earlier this year when I was on an audition with my daughter Kelsey at the Ithaca College <clears throat> and an excerpt from Carl Polnack who is the dean of the school of music at Ithaca College and this really sums up how I feel about music probably better than anything um, music has been at the heart of the human experience for roughly 40,000 years. It's hard to be more exact because music is both prehistoric and preliterate. Fossil evidence suggests that we were building musical instruments long before we had any written language to describe them and to record them. Examine artifacts in any ancient culture, religious practice, or community, and without fail, you'll find music as a central sustaining practice within it. In that sense, times have not changed. We use music to carry us through our lives every day, perhaps in ways that go unnoticed. When we're born, when we graduate, when we're married, when we die, almost inevitably we need music. In crisis, we turn to music instinctively, reflectively. Millennia before science helped us understand our existence, our languages helped us share it. Music was one of the primary ways that we gathered and created music with one another. In many ways, music is unchanging and an unchangeable practice. Teachers still train young musicians in the ancient way, patiently, carefully, one at a time, apprentice and master teacher, passing along knowledge and skill, which has taken thousands of years for us to acquire. Music is like food and water. It's a basic requirement for life that no one should have to live without. And today, many go hungry and thirsty. And the need is great. And that really sums up why it's important to me and why I do what I do with the music boosters. Um, this is why we're so excited in with such a young a group of young, talented directors in the Granville School System. It's been fun and exciting to watch the program go these past 10 years that I've been involved, <clears throat> seeing more musicians get started. And because of the continued success, stay with the music through their senior years. It didn't always used to happen. Um, in the high school, it's been exciting to watch the concert band grow into two groups with the level of music and musicianship raised. And when I speak to the fifth grade parents every April whose students are beginning band next year, it's awesome when a student has aspirations about being in blue band and they haven't even picked up an instrument. It's exciting to see the choirs continue to receive superior ratings in state contests. I think for the past two years, 
Jay can probably tell me if I'm wrong. I think the choirs have got straight ones the last two years at State. Or as long as Kristen's been directed. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and this year the Symphonia Orchestra uh, ran up a level in class uh, in music and received a state that received a superior rating. First time ever. And this all starts at the beginning levels. And I understand in this past year, there were some scheduling challenging issues at the intermediate school to keep a consistent level of instruction. Uh, but I do know that the directors and the administration are working hard to improve this. And I was also extremely pleased this year to find out uh, that there was an assistant orchestra director, which is continuing this next year. I'm hoping that uh, that will become a permanent full-time position because that does um, strengthen that program as well. So where does Music Boosters come in, which is the reason I'm here. Um, I describe our organization as the wants of the music department. I want this, I want that. You give it the needs, we're going to give it the wants. And I will remind you that we support music in all levels, kindergarten through 12th grade. Uh, when I first got involved in music here at Granville, um, the organization was probably raising about $25,000, which is not bad. But over the same period of time, the music programs have been very successful in growing participation. Success breeds success. This requires additional resources to support the programs. And in this next coming school year, uh, we have budgeted for expenditures of about $39,400. So we feel it's very manageable. Uh, since the last two years combined, we have raised and donated nearly $90,000 back to the music programs here in Granville. Um, over the past two years, in addition to our normal budgeted expenses, um, we furnished the following extras. Uh, $3,000 in wireless microphones for the theater. Uh, this past, we just approved with GEF. Uh, Wendy Biddle is great. She reaches out to us. Uh, $2,260 with funds from, uh, in addition to funds that GEF is providing for the electric strings program, which I understand is having their debut performance for the July celebration this year. Um, if what I heard is correct. Um, also, we helped a couple years ago with GEF to supply African drums and percussive instruments to the intermediate school. Um, you know, we purchased over $9,000 of risers for the theater, um, which does two things. Number one, extends the life of the risers that we have in all the choir rooms. And number two, minimizes the disruption when every group that is performing uses a set of choir risers in the theater. And the marching band, the big monkey. When we came to our first Greenville football game, there was no marching band. We almost moved. <laughs> um, when my son got involved, uh, who graduated in 2012, so you can do the math back, there were maybe 40 members in the marching band. Uh, this past year, that number topped 100 for the first time. Um, we have purchased additional uniforms, plumes, raincoats, garment bags, and additional storage rack to accommodate that group growth. Uh, total cost has been, over the last two and a half years, $28,990. And that doesn't even touch, it, all those expenses don't even touch on Blue Steel Jazz Band, Blue Notes, Ace of Pellas, Bluegrass Ensemble. Just when you think you get a breather, two years ago we found out that the ladies' gowns have been discontinued. This is a blessing in disguise if you have a daughter that has worn a gown. <laughs> uh, last May, we were going to state contest, and my wife was sewing a girl into her gown on the two-hour bus ride to Canton. Um, so this next year, uh, we, the ladies will all be wearing new dresses for all the performances at the total cost to replace of about $8,300. Um, we're fortunate that, uh, you know, I'll talk to anybody. And we, I, I was talking to a booster president of a, no, of a local adjoining school, and uh, they were talking about she was getting ready to have her eighth grade meeting, which is where they lose half the kids because of the expense of going from eighth grade into high school and what it takes to high school students expense-wise. And uh, so we made a phone call, and we're donating all the gowns that are in good condition to Keith High School their program. So, uh, we have one more large capital project that we're working on. I have no idea how we're going to fund it at this point because it's going to cost around $12,000. Uh, no idea if it'll happen this year, uh, but we're hoping. Um, maybe part of it. 
I don't know. Uh, but how do we make all this happen? Um, we understand fundraiser burnout, and that was a large discussion last year. And for our fundraisers, we don't ask for the students to sell anything. But we do appreciate their performances uh, that they share with us from time to time at, at, at a couple of the events. The one thing we do need is volunteers, and that's community support. Um, if you break it up into two and a half hour segments, there are about 350 two and a half hour time slots. And yes, I occupy about 40 of those, so it's significantly smaller for everybody else. Our fundraisers are simple. Lemon shake up, which you are all welcome to sign up for a shift. Uh, the mattress sale at the end of August, 50-50 tickets for football games, the fall craft show, and the hosting of contests, uh, which we drive uh, concessions money from. And that also saves expensive transporting the kids out of the school system. And this is in addition to our generous support of our individual members and our corporate sponsors. And I like to eat, so we throw in a couple of restaurant fundraisers too. And finally, um, the thing that makes this program unique and the reason I love it so much is I can't stress enough the tremendous support that we see from the parents, community, administration, board, superintendent. It's always refreshing and I always make this point and you don't know how much it means because it doesn't happen anywhere. When we ask for something, the answer is not just yes. Matt says, how can I help? What can I do? Ryan says, what do you need from me? It, you know, Lisa, anybody. They want to help us, and so we really appreciate that. And I can promise you that doesn't happen in every school system. So thank you very much. That's what we've been up to, and uh, maybe we'll maybe you'll see. Uh, if we're lucky, we'll you, see the retirement of Blue Bus shortly. Who's <laughs> 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 the point anyway? So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Brad. And I have to run because yep. I was supposed to meet somebody else about an hour ago. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Just quickly before we move on, I, I want to thank everybody for um, participating in the public comments today. Um, it's really nice to live in a school district where people are so passionate about um, the well-being and success of our students. So um, I just wanted to thank everybody for um, participating today. <clears throat> and with that... Um, can, can I make a suggestion? Yeah. Because we actually have a couple that is here for recognition for the donation on the addendum yeah, and, yeah, and maybe yeah. maybe we can just dispense of that item yes. um, and and Peter and Carla and Quinn are here uh, and and it is the donation on the addendum in appreciation for services at Granville Elementary School and I don't know if you guys want to say anything on as to why you wanted you felt compelled to make the donation but if you don't that's okay but I just felt like instead of me speaking for you maybe you wanted to make a comment Where should I go? you can stand right there <laughs> <laughs> we moved to Granville because we wanted to be part of a community that valued education as much as we valued education and we found out that this community really embraces those uh, things even more than we realized when our daughter Quinn had some sudden eye problems that made her education more difficult on a day-to-day -day basis. And it was remarkable and phenomenal how receptive the staff was at Granville Elementary School, her individual teacher, many others that you know, I should list, but we, we won't list tonight. Uh, but it, it just really gave us a, uh, a sense of reassurance that while we're dealing with our health issue, that behind us and supporting us was the elementary school, the education system, to really make sure that her education didn't miss a beat. Carly, you want to add anything else? Um, I think through the whole process for Quinn, she did write a letter, so yeah. we have the letter, and yeah. um, I think she ended it with, she wants an excellent education award given to Ms. Goins, her teacher. Yeah. Um, she received one for the archery team, so she makes it very special, um, which it is. Uh, but never was she treated as anything but the individual she always was. And the empowerment for her, the self-determination that she was allowed to have, which I think is 
plays along with the discussion you were just having. Mm -hmm. um, I think she's a pretty happy girl now. And she was in no way limited in her education because of her inability to see very clearly. So, did you want to say anything more? <laughs> well, thank you very thank much you. for coming in. We thank appreciate you your donation. And I, I would ask that you instruct Mr. Sobel to do a roll call to accept that. I One item. Motion and then yeah. Yeah. So, second. Okay. okay. With gratitude. Yeah. Yeah. Motion and, and then second. Uh, can you take the roll? Mr. Janice. Aye. Ms. Deeds. Aye. Mr. Kahn. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. Dr. Corman. Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Everyone, I wanted to make sure that we didn't extend their evening beyond um, <laughs> what was necessary. So well, we thank you very much thank for you. coming. Thank you. And feel free, you can now <laughs> depart and, and you. you don't have to stay for the rest of the meeting. <laughs> what? <laughs> Good night, everyone. Good night. Hi, thank, thank you. you. I think they appreciated us moving yeah. around. <laughs> Thank you. She was item 12. Right? Yes, I know, I know. <laughs> yeah. All right, so, which takes us back to board report. Back to board report. I just am very quickly going to give you a few statistics about um, the CTEC graduating class. Um, they had their uh, honor ceremony May and May, uh, right before, 27th, I think. Um, they had 281 seniors um, participate in the honor ceremony, 38 seniors received scholarships totaling $434,000. 22 students have enlisted in the U.S. military. 269 or 88% of the current seniors have earned an industry credential. Um, this year's seniors earned 1,678 college credit hours. Um, and 31% of current seniors are already in related employment, um, employment related to their programs. So on, uh, on a, um, CTEC report card, I think we do very, very well. So, um, and then I, I also asked um, to compile the numbers going on to two and four year colleges, which is actually, I think, a majority of the, of the class, but I, I don't know that for sure, but I will report that back in July. So, um, a successful year at CTEC. Excellent, thank you. Thanks. Thomas, do you have anything from the Education Foundation? I'll make a couple of comments about GEF and the exciting plans for this coming 4th of July celebration. Uh, they will be the first annual Blue, White, and Boom event on uh, Saturday, July 2nd at the Robbins Hunter Museum. This is an event open to all Granville High School graduates, as well as staff and administration and other I think that's the, the invite list officially, but I'm sure that other interested parties and then supporters of the GEF are welcome. Uh, it will be um, hosted at the Robin Hunter Museum for a couple of hours with uh, music by our high school music groups. Um, and we're not exactly sure what to expect in terms of the number of attendees, but it's gonna be a great occasion to just start the effort to get our alumni uh, together on a regular basis, on an annual basis, we hope, uh, and that'll be a great start. Uh, also on July 4th, uh, the morning of the parade, the Granville Education Foundation will have a float uh, in the parade and that uh, will host um, the winners of the Jody Van Tyne Award as well as grant recipient staff in uh, the board of the Granville Education uh, Foundation and other supporters. So it's really neat to see um, some real great activity there. I especially am excited about the alumni uh, events because I think it will be a great chance to get some groups together. There's also a special alumni uh, meeting this year for is it 50th year anniversary yeah. group? The class of 66. And the class of 1966 will have a special tour of our facilities and a special welcoming by the GEF. So it's neat to see that coming together uh, for a community-wide alumni event. And all alumni event. Any other questions, Thomas? Very exciting. Yeah, yeah that's it's great. Good to see that moving forward. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, action agenda. Okay. Uh, the first item, 11.01, is the approval of the coaching manual as part of our review of the athletic policies. We uh, looked at a variety of the exemplars and we have some recommended changes. So moved. Second. Any questions? Take the roll, please. Mr. Miller. Aye. Ms. Deeds. Aye. Mr. Kahn. Aye. Mr. Janice. Aye. Dr. Corman. Aye. Thank you.
11.02 is our annual update of the employee handbook. So moved. Second. Any questions? Sorry. <laughs> Most of the changes are just the annual updates that would be required for change of dates. I'm, I'm checking with Tiny. Nothing major. Other than some names and phone numbers, that's it. Okay. Great. Take the roll, please. Ms. Deed. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. Mr. Ginny. Aye. Mr. Corman. Aye. Dr. Corman. Aye. Thank you. Uh, item 11.03 is the annual renewal, renewal of the food service agreement, which is we renew every single year. So Second. Thank you. Any questions? With appreciation for John to come along and talk about it. That's always really nice to hear with you there. Yeah, nice job. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Any changes in costs or? No. No. Okay. I mean, I, I mean, I mean, you know, besides, there may be increases in their base food costs. Right, but, but there's contract. no changes in our, really, the only changes would be if we were to change the uh, meal rates, which we're not doing. Any questions? Take a roll, please. Mr. Miller. Aye. Mr. Janice. Aye. Mr. Kahn. Aye. Ms. Deeds. Aye. Dr. Corman. Aye. Thank you. 11.04 uh, is a contract contracted service agreement. So moved. Second. Uh, this is for our strength and conditioning services. Uh, Derek Fry, who has been providing those services for the past year. Any questions? Take roll, please. <coughs> Mr. Miller. Aye. Mr. Kahn. Aye. Ms. Deeds. Aye. Mr. Janice. Aye. Dr. Gorman. Aye. 11.05 uh, is the annual renewal of the Global Scholar Diploma Program Second. through CCWA. Thomas. Second. Oh. Amy and then Thomas. Thomas. What, what's our kind of other expenses associated with the Global Scholars Program. I know that parents pay for trips and things like that. Do we have staffing that's in some way dedicated or a portion so, of some? Yeah, we have um, a portion of Jeremy Hopping's schedule is dedicated to the uh, kind of management of the Global Scholars Diploma Program. And then we have transportation costs to, they take a couple of trips into Columbus to like the Honda factory and meet with Honda and Mattel and a couple of other uh, local businesses that are more international mm -hmm. and um, and typically that is most school districts it's a ten thousand dollar fee for us because we're the pioneering school district we have a fee of five thousand so it you know, paid to be good and first in this situation and I think I, you know I just want to applaud everybody that was involved in this program and continues to be you know it's extremely cost-effective given the you know, amount that we get out of it right I think again it's one of those things that culturally makes us more aware whether you're a kid that's in the program or not I think it really drives a lot in our school district and I think it's money very well spent so I think the program is well conceived and it's really great to see it growing I think as, as you as we move forward and talk about global studies case six as part of language acquisition at that level, we're really talking about a broader perspective and the Asia Society competencies that are the, the foundation of the Global Scholars to pro Program at the high school level really can be translated down to the elementary and so that's part of our conversation that we're having as, as a planning team. So I'm excited about that. I agree. Any comments, questions? Take a please. Ms. Deeds. Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. Mr. Janice? Aye. Mr. Cohn? Aye. Dr. Cornman? Aye. Thank you. 11.06, uh, administrative and exempt employee salary schedule increase. So moved. Second. I'm recking, recommending a 2% increase in alignment with the collective bargaining agreement that is currently in place. Any questions? Table, please. Ms. Deeds? Aye. Mr. Janice? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. Mr. Kahn? Aye. Dr. Corman? Aye. Thank you very much. 11.07 .07 is the SOAR Leading for Learning Collaborative Agreement. So moved. Second. Thank you. This is, a, we've been in this partnership for over eight years, I believe, and it's with the Tell for Kids, and we they do a lot of our data analyses, but also, uh, professional development opportunities for our staff. Take the roll, please. 
Mr. Miller. Aye. Mr. Cohen. Aye. Mr. Janice. Aye. Ms. Deeds. Aye. Mr. Foreman. Aye. 11.08 is a year's leave of absence for child care leave. So moved. Second. Ms. Deeds. Aye. Mr. Janice. Aye. Mr. Cohen. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. Dr. Foreman. Aye. Thank you. 11.09 uh, is a maternity leave. So moved. Second. Mr. Miller. Aye. Mr. Cohen. Aye. Ms. Deeds. Aye. Mr. Janice. Aye. Dr. Corman. Aye. Thank you. 11.10 uh, is electronic calamity makeup plan for the 16 17 school year. So moved. Second. This is our annual approval for our calamity day makeup plan. It does not go into effect until after five days or the equivalent hours. Questions? Take your please. Mr. Janice. Aye. Ms. Deeds. Aye. Mr. Cohen. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. Dr. Foreman. Aye. Uh, 1111 is Leaders for Learning Grant. So moved. Second. Uh, once you have been identified as a Leader for Learning, you can apply to the Licking County Foundation for a $500 grant. Lori Fender applied and received that uh, grant to attend Teachers College. Do we have many teachers that are Leaders for Learning? We have. A nice long, a long list. That actually, seems like there was a longer yeah. list. We have recommended her. I would say it's challenge. probably been in existence for the last ten years. Yeah, at least, yeah. Hey, girl, please. Ms. Deeds. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. Mr. Janice. Aye. Mr. Cohen. Aye. Dr. Corman. Aye. Eleven point one two is the approval of the paving contract for summer work. So moved. Second. Okay. Uh, obviously, this is in excess of twenty-five thousand dollars, which is a threshold allowable by law without board approval. So, and it was bid. And it was bid. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> what all uh, parking lots are included here? We have most of the well, the middle school and high school has the parking lots, especially the parking lot that is just south of the uh, tennis court. Okay. That area that has been the old tennis court will be um, redone. And then the area behind um, Cindy Schaefer's room and John Bennett's old room, which is a gravel pit, that is going to be uh, resurfaced. And then the elementary, the back parking lot, which is where uh, we are moving our um, arrival and dismissal for buses in the back parking lot. We are redoing the paving in that area to allow for that. Did I miss anything? Okay. There's striping also. Yeah. Striping yeah. also yeah. along with that in all the places. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll be finished before uh, early August. Keep your fingers crossed. <laughs> <laughs> Dry weather. We need. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. <laughs> Take the roll, please. Mr. Miller. Aye. Mr. Kahn. Aye. Mr. Janice. Aye. Ms. Deeds. Aye. Dr. Corman. Aye. Uh, 1113 is the approval of flooring expenditure of 52075 Motion. Motion. Second. Uh, this is state term pricing, um, but it is in excess of $25,000. Uh, what we've been doing is replacing a lot of the classroom furniture with a, or uh, flooring with a product called Florbo, which looks like a, um, a laminate wood floor, but it is much more durable and strong. I don't know if you've ever seen Jeremy Hopping's classroom, but he has it in his classroom. There are several classrooms in the middle school that have it, but um, we will do additional removal of carpet and uh, flooring, and we will be re-carpeting this boardroom um, because it is starting to uh, tear up um, in several locations. Any questions? Take the roll, please. Mr. Cohen. Aye. 
Mr. Miller? Aye. Ms. Deeds? Aye. Mr. Janice? Aye. Dr. Cornwall? Aye. Okay, now if you skip back to the addendum, <coughs> the action item 1114 is the authorization for computer purchases. So moved. Second. These are, again, all state term pricing, uh, but we exceed the 25000 threshold. Oh. Any questions? No? Take a roll, please. Mr. Miller. Aye. Mr. Janice. Aye. Ms. Deeds. Aye. Mr. Collins. Aye. Dr. Corman. Aye. These are all part of our PI uh, budget allocation, just so you're aware. Uh, 1115 is the approval of the new industrial technology teacher at the high school. So moved. Second. Thank you. <clears throat> this is a direct hire as opposed to going through. Correct. This is a, this is a replacement for the uh, person who resigned that position, and um, it is very difficult to find an industrial tech teacher. Yeah. Uh, I think it's probably one of the most challenging positions to actually staff. Um, so uh, we are excited to bring him into the fold. And CTEC has made a hire for the other position? That is correct. Great. Yep. Okay, Take Mr. Janice. Aye. Ms. Deeds. Aye. Mr. Cohen. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. Dr. Corman. Aye. Uh, the 1116 is the approval of the guidance secretary. So moved. Second. Second. Uh, so what we have decided to do is move the secretarial position that was held by Bob, um, Barb Helwig that was at the front office to the guidance secretary or guidance office, which was an aide position. So we'll have Kathy Frank in the front office, uh, Bobby Seidel in the back office, and then we will be replacing Barb with an aide that will be uh, manning the front window. Makes sense. Okay. Yeah, yeah there we'll have some cost savings from the combination of the two chains. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any questions? No. Take a roll, please. Mr. Miller. Aye. Mr. Janice. Aye. Ms. Deeds. Aye. Mr. Cohn. Aye. Dr. Corman. Aye. Okay. So, are we in the consent We're agenda? Consent. Yes, okay, sorry. thank you. Sorry about that. Yes, no, no. Consent agenda. All right. So, 12.01A through B, nine. Or, or C, 9. And I would also call your attention to the one consent item on the addendum. Well, there's actually two donations there. Well, there's a second. Yeah. Vote, so okay. All right. You already approved it. <laughs> so moved. <laughs> yes. Um, obviously, the resignations I'd like to uh, state with appreciation of service. Um, Namarta Roberts has been. Uh, fantastic um, guidance counselor at the elementary level we, we were regretfully will have to accept her resignation um, but she's moving on to better things in the family world uh, Chad Timmons was a uh, our, our school psychologist that we hired last year um, and he is um, moving on as well so obviously Vince Galoni was our baseball teacher for our Baseball teacher. <laughs> Baseball coach for almost nine years and um, a fantastic head coach. We appreciate that. Uh, his service and Jacqueline Walker is resigning as our volleyball coach. So um, seventh grade volleyball coach. We appreciate all of their um, service to the school district. Um, I would also call your attention to our new hires, uh, Cody Masters and Kim uh, Kimberly Markle. Uh, I will tell you that both of them are former Granville High School students, uh, which again, we've hired three now, which is an indication that uh, they're going out getting successful degrees and they want to come back to Granville. And um, I don't know any of these people except for when I interview them, but wow, are they good. Um, very impressed with them, so I'm looking forward to 
uh, their participation in the school district on the other side Good. of the equation. And um, that's it. And obviously recognition of donations. We always appreciate that the community thinks of us. Any questions about the consent agenda? No. Take roll, please. Mr. Gates. Aye. Ms. Deeds. Aye. Ms. Miller. Aye. Mr. Cohen. Aye. Dr. Corman. Aye. Moves okay. us to the financials. The financials. Um, first item, the May financial report. So moved. Second. Um, I, there's not a whole lot to, in the actual financials, you know, since I did the big presentation back in May. Um, if you look at what happened, went on in May, the one thing you'll see is our purchase services were a little above what we were um, expecting. That is because we did pay two electric bills again, but this time Matthew was on purpose um, that we paid two electric bills. Um, so we don't have an electric bill this month to pay. And that'll, so that'll come back somewhat in the line. Um, supplies, we were over for the month, but we've already seen that that's going to correct itself in June. It's actually a good thing that we were over in May because that means that um, everybody was doing a better job of getting all their stuff in earlier, which we have been encouraging them to do um, so that we are not trying to um, balance things and trying to figure out what's some expenditures in July after all the secretaries have left, which is kind of gets kind of confusing after a while and keep track of everything. So it's actually a good thing that we were overestimated in May, um, especially knowing that we're not, that we will be well below estimated in June. Um, the other, the only other thing I wanted to talk about um, is I did put a, on the last page, on page 11, um, I did put a summary of the food service program since John was here earlier um, doing the presentation. Um, what you'll see is um, for our revenue, which comes from three sources, the sale of food, um, federal reimbursements, and that's for students with free and reduced lunch, um, and then catering sales when AVI is doing specific stuff outside of the lunchroom. Um, those revenues were almost $736,000 this year. The actual expenditures through May payments to AVI was about $708.5,000. We're expecting Ju June should be somewhere in the $15,000 range. Um, last year was like 14 and a half, which will leave us from food service operations a net revenue over expenditures of about $12,300, um, which is, again, that our target is for that to at least be zero each year so that we are capturing enough in revenue to offset the direct food service costs. Now we do have um, four sources of expenditures that come out of the food service account that we do not make an attempt to recover through our costs of um, lunch or through charging parents for using pay for it. The biggest one is the pay for it fees, you know, which is the online fee system for, for lunches. Um, there's about $22,000 in fees for that for the year. Um, we do not charge the parents for that either for food service or on the other side for fee for school fees. Um, there is equipment repair that we do uh, to maintain some of the equipment. There are non-food supplies that we buy. A lot of that, you know, is paper products, napkins, other things like that. And finally, we have to pay some state inspection fees. So that we can operate. Um, and the net of those additional non-AVI expenses are $38,000. Um, obviously, we only have a $12,000 additional revenue that we brought in. Um, you will remember in the, in the five-year forecast, we always budget $25,000 um, as a potential transfer from the operating budget fund to the food service to cover these non-operational um, costs. Um, and what you'll see in one of my later items is that I'm recommending a transfer. It's probably going to be 16,989, which is what we are now. The only thing that would uh, cause it not to be that would be if something like 
the freezer broke between now and the end of the year and June 30th. Um, so we, there's not a specific dollar amount, but, but barring, it won't. Hmm? <laughs> but it won't. But it won't. Yeah. Bar, barring a, barring such a calamity. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not that I'm superstitious. Yeah, barring such a calamity, um, the amount we'll tr that we're going to transfer is sixteen thousand nine eighty nine, which is less than the twenty five that we have budgeted, which will leave us a little bit of startup cash then in the food service account to start next year. So I do want to highlight that and you know, since John was doing the presentation earlier. Just a, and the other good thing, this is now the second year that all of the revenues and all the expenditures are all for the current school year. We yeah, we stopped the practice that had been mm -hmm. going on for quite a while of holding bills from the prior year until we got revenues for the current year to be able to pay the prior year. Remember we did the one time payment. Um, to stop doing that and so we are truly operating on a year a year basis where the revenues and the expenditures are both for the same school year okay. questions as far as the financial report. it's a good trend hmm? it's a good trend on yeah the, on yep. the food service. yeah we're very happy with where we are with the food service program um, it's, where, it's where we need to be so that you know, what we don't want is to have to subsidize the actual food service. And this is now two years in a row on a current accounting basis yeah. that we have finished you know, with in the black by a little bit each year. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, thanks. Take roll, please. Mr. Miller. Aye. Mr. Jace. Aye. Mr. Cohn. Aye. Ms. Deans. Aye. Dr. Foreman. Aye. Okay, item 13.02 is the final appropriation for the year we are concluding in a couple of weeks. So moved. Second. Um, this is virtually unchanged from the one that we passed a couple, a few months ago. The only two changes that, that I really, we have to make is the auditors require our appropriations for our federal funds to exactly match the dollar amount we're getting from the state and a month or so ago the state lowered our title 2a money by about ninety dollars and raised our title one money by about two hundred dollars and so we have got to do a new appropriation to so that the appropriation matches what the state is actually giving us any questions take real quick Mr. Miller. Aye. Mr. Kahn. Aye. Mr. Janice. Aye. Ms. Deeds. Aye. Dr. Corman. Aye. Thank you. Um, 13.03, which is the temporary appropriation for the year, which begins in two weeks. So moved. Second. Um, the, you know, the appropriation, which I believe, is in the. She don't put a copy of it in the. She did not put a copy of the. Um, Mostly, I'll explain, it's mostly a continuation of where we're expecting to be. Um, we did get our federal allocations in the last couple of weeks for next year. Um, our Title I and our IDAA money did both go up um, from last year, which is a good, I guess, a good thing. Mm -hmm. It's per partly reflective of more services um, that we're providing, you know, as far as the number of students we have qualifying for IDEA. Um, and a little bit more who are qualifying for Title I services, which is for us because of the nature of the district, our only Title I services is reading intervention at the elementary school. Um, it's all we use that for. You will see our overall appropriation is significantly lower than it was last year, and that's because we're not refunding $28 million worth of bonds this year. And so we do not have to make a $28 million expenditure to pay off the bonds. Um, that will be a much more normal. One thing you will see in there that is going to be new is you will see an appropriation in the 004 account, which is a capital account. That is for the debt for the roof at the intermediate school. Since we are issuing notes, that money has to go into an 004 account. Um, we can't just put it in the PII account for it to be in there. And so you'll, that's really the only line that's going to look new in there um, the pi appropriation is in line with the five-year plan that we have 
um, put that we put together and that you saw as part of the um, as part of the, my presentation last month. This, of course, will be just temporary, so we can operate until we do a permanent appropriation, which will be in September. Take it open. Mr. Miller. Aye. Mr. Janice. Aye. Mr. Khan. Aye. Ms. Deeds. Aye. Dr. Cornman. Aye. Thank you. Um, Thirteen oh four, the renewal of the insurance consultant contract. So moved. Second. Thank you. Uh, we did go through a bit RFP process for the insurance consultant. That is not had actually not been done since. Um, Peg was here. Um, I felt it was time that we do that. Um, also, we had some concerns about the service we had been getting from Gallagher. Um, Gallagher ended up, we have chosen them again. They have changed some of their service delivery model um, to meet our needs. Um, they have also lowered the contract cost um, beginning January 1 of next year. Um, from what we are paying now, we're currently paying $15 per member per month, and that is going down to $12.50 per member per month on January 1st um, for two years, and then we'll be go then moving to $13.75 per member per month. So the cost will be a, will be reduced from what we are paying right now, and we were. And basically, we are happy with the changes that they made as far as the service delivery um, to meet our needs. Any questions? No. Take roll, please. Ms. Deeds. Aye. Mr. Janice. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. Mr. Cohn. Aye. Dr. Corman. Aye. Thank you. 13.05 is the resolution for the fund transfer for the food service, which I talked about a few minutes ago. So moved. Second. Thank you. Any questions? Any other? Yeah. Again, you'll see there is no dollar amount in there, um, but it, it is going to be an amount equal to all the expense, non, non food service expenses except for the pay for it fees. So again, hopefully it will be the number that was on that sheet. 15. The six, 16, yeah, the 16, 9, what, 89, 9, 89, or whatever. Okay. Any questions? Take a roll, please. Ms. Deeds. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. Or, I'm sorry, Mr. Janice. Aye. Mr. Kahn. Aye. Dr. Corman. Aye. Okay, 11.06, which is another fund transfer. So moved. Second. Um, this is a move to move a little bit under six hundred dollars. The student newspaper um, in went, ran a negative cash amount this year. We allowed them to spend more than they had in the bank in anticipation of revenues, and the revenues did not quite come in as as strongly as they thought it would, um, leaving them in a negative situation. Uh, Mr. Durst was here was covering the the cost of that from uh, his 018 account um, with the understanding that this is not going to happen. We're not going to be quite so lenient next year with them as far as their spending relative to potentially having revenue. <laughs> so like this, this does not affect the operating budget in any way. <laughs> Probably like most newspapers in this country, unfortunately. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think their advertising revenue was less than they had. Mm -hmm. anticipated it was going to be. Mm -hmm. Take a roll, please. Mr. Miller. Aye. Mr. Cohen. Aye. Mr. Janice. Aye. Ms. Deeds. Aye. Dr. Corman. Aye. Yep. Um, at this point, I'd like to entertain a motion to move into executive session to consider the employment of a public employee or official. So moved. Second. Mr. Wilkins? Mr. Deeds. Aye. Mr. Janice? Aye. Mr. Cohn? Aye. Dr. Cornman? Aye. 
where we know action follows.